So yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome from the organizers, uh, which includes myself, Arvin, Yongyu, and Andy Zeng from Google. And um, we've got a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, we have Jitendra from UC Berkeley, Chelsea Fim from Stanford, Joseph Lim from KAIST, Avinav Gupta from CMU, and Kristen Groman from UT Austin. And here's the, the schedule today. So we've got uh, two invited uh, talks to begin with, then a series of uh, spotlight talks starting at 9.50, um, which will all be in person. Then we'll shift to uh, virtual talks um, for the rest of that spotlight section. Um, we'll then, for those in-person talks, have poster sessions, um, followed by then two more invited uh, speakers. Uh, we'll then have some lunch. Uh, and then we'll head over to the call opening ceremony and then head back here then for the afternoon session, which includes um, more virtual um, spotlight talks. Um, and then finally, a uh, uh, invited to talk by Abhinav. Uh, we'll have a, uh, a best paper award for the um, submitted papers. Um, this is a best paper award sponsored by Dyson and the prize is actually a Dyson product of the winners choosing, which is very exciting. Um, and then finally, we'll end with a panel discussion. For the uh, the talks, um, if you could, everything goes through Zoom. So uh, when you when you present, uh, whether it's in uh, person or virtually, if you could just make sure you're sharing your slides um, through Zoom, um, such that it makes the process seamless for everyone being in person and virtual. Okay. And with that said, we'll start with the uh, first invited speaker. Yeah, so our first invited speaker, Professor Chitendra Malik. So Chitendra is the Arthur J. Chick Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley. He has done a lot of amazing work on computer vision and computational modeling of human vision and computer graphics and many other topics. His work has been recognized via numerous awards, including best paper awards and test of time paper awards. So let's welcome Jitendra for his invited talk. Uh, should I share with you or we'll just do it this way? Uh, should I do if I start with you, then you can see me, I guess that's oh the... camera is going to here. Um... Oh, so I'll just stop with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this talk. And uh, uh, I want to talk about learning robotics tasks from videos. Uh, but I want to start with a bit of uh, history. Uh, so uh, in computer vision, we have been in the data set business for quite some time. So this is a paper from my group in 21 years ago. Okay, it was at ICCV 2001. And before that, uh, the, the only the main data set in computer vision was MNIST, which had been collected like by Jan Lekun and M uh, postal service employees of people just writing digits. So there wasn't anything daily around for natural images. And this was an era where there was no YouTube. There were no collections of photos on the web. So we had to buy this collection of photos from Corel. And then Berkeley undergrads went around marking boundaries of objects. Okay. And, uh, and this is how this business started. But our intuition was that from that most AI problems uh, need huge amounts of data because there's all this variability which you cannot write down rules for. It's only going to be there in the data. And then there's this whole era of data sets. So at uh, Caltech, uh, there was a data set called Caltech 101. And at this time, inter the internet was such that you could download photos from the web and there were enough photos. And that uh, was done by Fefe, who was a graduate student of Pietro Perona. 
And uh, then it moved on to Caltech 256. And then uh, there was a Pascal challenge. This is created around 2007, which was based on images and the annotations there were of objects to be recognized. ImageNet, which was done by Feifei when she became a faculty member, but you can think of it as like Caltech 101 in a sense. Uh, it's starting from Caltech 101 to Caltech 256 to, to Caltech 1000 or Caltech 10,000 in that spirit. And uh, then we have uh, this data set Coco. So the computer vision community in the last 20 years, uh, the progress has been defined by data sets and benchmarks on those data sets. So the data sets provide training data and then they provide us a measure for comparing which approaches are doing better. And now the data sets have moved from static data sets to active data sets. And uh, there's uh, this work on Epic Kitchens from Dima Daman. Uh, 100 days of hand, this is a more recent data set. So now you have a lot of data sets which correspond to sort of human activity. And we have finally what I think of as the mother of all data sets. It's called Ego4D. And this is a paper uh, where if, if you see this list of 84 authors, the first author is Kristen Grauman, who is actually giving the next talk, I think. So she'll maybe talk more about it. And then I'm the last in this list of 84 authors. And uh, this uh, is data set collected around the world of people doing activities like uh, having breakfast or washing clothes or playing the piano. And uh, we have more, now more than 3,500 hours of this video. Okay, collected from like 15 different places around the world. Okay, but this is a robotics conference. So we want to go from vision to robotics. And the vision is really that if we have data of human activity, we can use that to train robots to perform that same human activity. So I think uh, it, it's kind of, uh, to me, there are two natural ways of, of learning that children have for how they learn robotic tasks. One is a reinforcement learning, which is that they try things out, so it's trial and error. And the second is imitation learning. They learn from observing their parents, caregivers, peers, et cetera. And that's for the robotics part, but they are relying on having a vision system which has developed over the same period and which is very sophisticated. And it's not just being trained for one task. So a good example is if you think about driving, self-driving cars are still not there after billions of miles of practice. Whereas a human teenager at the age of 16 learns to drive in like 20 hours of practice. Why? Because that 16 year old already has a vision system which has been trained. So it's been pre-trained, if you will, to use the, the jargon today. So that's what we want. We want a pre-trained vision system. That's one thing. And the second is we want to learn from imitation and we'll have access to all the videos in the web. So these are the two themes that I'm going to emphasize in my talk. So the first one uh, is about how to build a visual representation. So that teenager who starts to learn driving his vision system is not trained end to end for the task of driving. His vision system is already there. Okay, how do we do that? And uh, this is work from uh, Tete, Ilya, Trevor, and myself. And Tete and Ilya are actually there in the back. Uh, and uh, we have a, a talk in the main conference on this theme. But let me explain. So this is, uh, yeah, so as I said, uh, you can, uh, the paper is there. Uh, but uh, okay, what are the big ideas? So the big ideas is that we need to figure out what's the training objective, what's the data, and what's the model. So uh, in the computer vision community by now, there is a fair degree of agreement on what's the best way to do self-supervised learning to produce representations. And that is that, uh, and that is this idea of a masked autoencoder. So it's gonna play out. So you take the image, you divide it up into a bunch of patches, you delete a whole lot of them, you feed the rest, okay, into this encoder. So to repeat, take the image, divide it into lots of patches, mask away most of them, give the rest to the encoder, and then the task, and there's a, there's a decoder also being trained, and the task of the decoder is to reconstruct the whole image. 
So this is a very simple task in a way, and there's a history of problems like this in computer vision and in machine learning. What this requires is that you basically, you're completing the image, which means that you sort of need to know what are the boundaries of objects, what are the contexts, what's likely given the part of the object that you've seen. So it's making you a visual expert if, in order to do the task. So this task essentially requires, well, you could essentially memorize all sorts of all the images, but it would be better to generalize because you'll never get exactly the same images uh, in, uh, at this time. So that's the idea. And the uh, recent work is from uh, Kaiming He et al. at uh, CVPR 2022. And this is already a very, very cited paper. And it, it, there's a long history of visual representations, but I think this is currently the winner. So I'm just, as a vision person, I'll assert, okay, this is what you should do. Okay, so suppose we have agreed that this is the way to build visual representations. And uh, there are some nice properties here. No labels are used, no data augmentations. So we have got rid of the tyranny of supervision. We just are learning from visual data. It could be images, it could be video. Data augmentations are also being thrown out and let me editorialize a bit on that. Data augmentations are considered part of self-supervised learning techniques. But I would argue that data augmentations are inevitably cheating because the kind of data augmentation that you put in, for example, you may say that, okay, you can do a color change and it doesn't matter. Well, that's actually saying something about the task that for the recognition task, uh, color is not so important and so on. So usually data augmentations build in some extra knowledge. And typically what happens is that people who do data augmentations, they try data augmentation one, two, three, four, see which ones give you better results and then they select that. So in my view, this is bringing in supervision by the back door, okay. In master autoencoders, there's no such thing because we are working at the raw image level. Okay, uh, the data that was used here is uh, all over the place, uh, but Ego4D and data sets like that are, are the future because I think there's a photographer's bias in what kinds of photos we have. So the photos that we have when I go to Paris and I want to create a pretty picture of the Eiffel Tower is one kind of photo and then I upload them to my... Uh, you know, Instagram feed and to show my friends on uh, Facebook, et cetera. Well, then there are more mundane photos. And these are the mundane photos that you see on the top left. Okay, I'm going around washing dishes, uh, making some bread, cooking an omelet. And then I see my hands, I see the object that I'm manipulating. I mean, this is, the, this is what we see normal, all the time. We don't see these pretty pictures of the Eiffel Tower. Okay, I see them once in a while when I actually go to Paris and I'm in front of the Eiffel Tower, but your classic internet photo collections are biased towards that. So our general belief is the right kind of data is this kind of egocentric video of people doing the daily boring activities of everyday life. Okay, human behavior, maybe your your grocery shopping on the right, or maybe you're assembling some origami or whatever. And the computer vision community has sort of uh, like, it's like a big aircraft carrier, which was earlier all centered around like internet photos. Uh, ImageNet is a very representative example. And now we have steered it towards this egocentric video and actions being observed. Okay, so that's the kind of data we should use. And of course, the more the merrier. And the model is a transformer. Okay, this slide is not due to me, I, but uh, I, uh, you, it, if it evokes a transformer for you, you it's great. Okay, uh, so, uh, so what we do is we train one vision system, okay? So, uh, uh, so we, the visual system is trained using masked autoencoders on some huge collection of video, egocentric video, image net, whatever throw in everything into the sink because no labels are needed, right? So you just, everything is good. Okay, now we have trained effectively this pre-trained vision system and I'll go back to my example of sort of that 16 year old who learns how to drive. Actually in this setting, you should really think of it as a two year old who's starting to first pick up Lego blocks. 
And there's one visual encoder which starts from the pixels and converts this internal representation. And the idea is that this internal representation on top of it, if you try to train various tasks through imitation learning, reinforcement learning, what have you, they will become easier. Okay, and the comparison point is what's the sample complexity? How many examples do you need of the task to learn? Well, uh, if you had this pre-trained visual representation versus not. So we can plot these uh, learning curves and those show clearly the advantage of these pre-trained representations. And then the same pre-trained representation is being used for this set of tasks like reaching, picking, picking an object out of a fridge, that sort of thing. So let's uh, look at this. So then here are some results. So, uh, so these are doing, so there's a pick task, a push task, opening this toy uh, refrigerator, uh, different kinds of objects. And all of these have, each task has a, there is a task part which is separate, right? That's what you saw the policy pie task, but the visual representations are all the same. And how do we train controller heads? Okay, so we need to collect demonstrations. So this is sort of the imitation learning philosophy. And uh, so what do we do? Uh, okay, so this is, you'll see how uh, we have better versions now, but this is uh, Ilya trying to, uh, he's uh, trying to guess what the camera is seeing and he's trying to do the, the task. Okay, so the camera here is, uh, there's a camera attached to the manipulator. And then you, you, you get different training examples by moving the object around, okay? Fine? Okay, uh, so next, uh, and then, uh, so this is the robot view. So remember, it looks closer to the egocentric view, right? Okay, so you, uh, uh, so you, so, so this, this view is very natural because you, you can see the effect of sort of zooming so in computer vision, the standard idea is optical flow, that when you're driving, the road surface is sort of zooming out and that gives you strong constraints. So this is, this is basically telling you that when you have a camera on the arm, it's very advantageous. Okay, how well does it work? Okay, uh, so, uh, so there are various motor control tasks like picking, poking, uh, picking, pushing, so on. And... Uh, you want generalization. You want generalization to different objects, different scenes. I mean, when you train a simple end-to-end -end RL policy from pixels, then how does it know? Uh, I mean, I mean, every every scene is different, right? Whereas you want generalization across, like if you move this toy fridge from the left to the right, if you have a different object, you want generalization. Now, think of why the master auto encoder will help with this. The master autoencoder is being trained from given some patches, it's trying to complete the rest of the image. So essentially it's got knowledge of objects, object boundaries and so forth, because without that, it would not be able to complete the image. Okay, so this is generalization to different objects. So it sort of has to have a notion of object boundaries and segmentation in some form. And uh, then you can uh, clutter up the scene, add some unnecessary objects, so on. And uh, then here are metrics. I think, uh, again, I mean, the paper will be presented in the main conference. So for all the numbers you can uh, uh, attend, the, you should attend the talk. So for various tasks. And it turns out this representation is better than the other Uber representation that is popular, Clip. So Clip has been trained with like 400 million images and text pairs. So I think it's quite good for like those scenes of the Eiffel Tower and so on. But because it has to capture that semantics, the object names, Clip, the Clip representation will do a good job there. Here, I actually don't care about the names. To pick up an object, do I need to know whether it's an apple or a pear? I just need to know kind of the boundaries of the object. So that completion task of the image is, I think, actually a better, better suited. And the beauty is that we don't need any supervision, right? So, uh, so anyway, there are these, all these numbers. So, okay, uh, what else would you like? So the language story says you want to have models with scale and you want to have, uh, and you want to uh, get the benefit of big amounts of data. So we want two kinds of scaling behavior. Larger models, meaning more parameters, more flops, should you 
pay the price, you do better, right? We know this from the success of models like GPT-3 and chat GPT and so on. Uh, and, and then of course, more data, more data and a larger model will benefit from more data. So we have experiments which show that, that as you, uh, so that as you, as you go to sort of, uh, so there's a benefit from this VIT ego. So this bigger model, uh, better, bigger model, bigger data. That's a summary. And here are charts which show this. So the X axis in the first one, you see the number of parameters. So these are small and uh, VIT small, VIT large. So bigger models are, have more parameters, but their performance is better. And uh, for, you see this for two tasks. Okay, and then there is some comparison here with uh, other approaches. And uh, again, you can, you can look at the details there. But uh, I think that uh, overall, I feel that the field could do with standardization. So right now, so a month or so ago, we had a workshop at Berkeley where we invited various colleagues who are working in this area of visual supervision uh, of pre-trained models. And uh, pretty much everybody's paper suggests that their model is the best. And uh, the comparisons are not quite all on exactly the same frame. And uh, our experience in the computer vision community suggests that trying to come up with benchmarks that everybody would agree takes a bit of effort. But if you get that community agreement, then progress becomes more rapid because you understand which ideas are helpful and then you can take the union of all the good ideas and the field keeps getting better. So uh, benchmarking is regarded as boring, but it's actually, it's, uh, it, it's boring, but it provides accumulative progress. And I strongly want to advertise for and propose that. So yeah, as I said, I won't, uh, I mean, our numbers are great, but I won't, don't want to emphasize this too much. Okay, I have, I think uh, maybe 10 more minutes, right? Yeah. So, okay, so uh, uh, we, how do we, uh, we, we, let me go a little bit more into uh, uh, one aspect of this problem. Okay, so this is the learning from visual demonstrations. So you saw, how some of that data was collected. And this has become a hot topic now. And there are lots of papers on this at various conferences. And I think it should be a hot topic. I mean, this is, this is a worthwhile problem because we want to learn from visual demonstrations. Now, uh, the version that, that we had is shown here. And uh, so this one, you, okay, so this is, this is a thing where version which works well. So you have a, uh, a VR headset, and uh, this has got a good ability to detect and localize hands. So, so that is what is being capitalized on. So you're learning to move this cube, okay? And uh, what's being done on the right is a human is trying to do the task and then it's uh, being done on the robot. And now we've collected a bunch of demonstrations like this, which will be used for training. So this is the, this is how, I mean, the results that you're seeing uh, that you saw so far were, but it does seem tedious, right? I think I don't, I think that this is the, maybe the future for the short term, but this is not the long-term future. I just don't think this is uh, scalable. Okay, first of all, let me just, uh, okay, some just remarks on what, what we have already demonstrated with this uh, use of these, uh, uh, these representations. Uh, Okay, uh, so now I, I want to do something better on demonstrations. So this is what we would like. So you have on the left, you saw uh, a video of some human performing an action. And on the right, you have the robot performing that action. Okay, so this is what we would like. So that, what you see here is actually in a simulate, simulation environment. So the first, the task is there's an object on the table the robot first goes and picks up the object, and then it moves the object in the same way that the human has moved the object. Okay. So you should judge, look at the pose of the object, and the pose of the object should follow the same trajectory that the object follows when manipulated by the human. There's a first part which is going to be just picking up the object, right? But okay. And this is being done inside a physics simulator. 
So it's uh, so it it has to follow the laws of physics. You could say yes, but there's a sim to real gap, and that will prove uh, will will show with experiments in the real world. And here is actually an experiment in the real world. Let's see if it works. Okay. So did you see this? So the object is picked up in, and this is trying to follow the trajectory followed by a human. So this is, so if we can make this work at scale, we are kind of done with manipulation, right? Because there are millions of videos of humans doing all sorts of stuff. All we do is we give those videos to the robot and then the robot uh, learns from that and it can do the task. And uh, I think this vision has been stated before. The idea of demonstration actually goes back 50 years in robotics, but it, I, it's just that the painful details of the demonstration. So earlier, the demonstration used to be kinesthetic. You take the robot through the sequence of positions. Okay, then we have moved to uh, demonstrations, uh, which are, and then where, because those have sensing in them. And, and this is the next step. And I think this is the ultimate step. Just learn from watching videos. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So, so, so this is our approach. We call it 4D, 4D, and why 4D? Uh, we start from some internet video, and then we want to reconstruct the hand object trajectory in 4D. Okay, why the hand and the object are both in 3D, and then there's time. And if you can reconstruct that, then we will have a second stage, which will be that the robot learns to imitate that task using reinforcement learning in some physical simulator. And uh, it gets dense reward. So at every moment in time, it will try to copy what the human did. Okay, that's the idea. So there's, so we need to have, so the challenging parts are, are, are the vision parts. How do you reconstruct hands and objects from video? And we had a paper on that at uh, ICCB 2021, which was uh, reconstructing hand-object interaction in the world. And uh, this was from single images. And basically what we have now is the, so that was 3D reconstruction from a single frame. And now we have the 4D version of the problem solved. Okay. So this is uh, this was the 3D version where what you do it was, you, you reconstruct the hand in 3D. So there is a lot of technology in computer vision on reconstructing people. And for people, we have 3D models like simple and so on, or simple X, et cetera. So we reconstruct the hand. Object, you're essentially matching to some kind of CAD model. So then you can estimate the pose. And, uh, and then there is a lot of other detail which I'm uh, skipping over. Okay, uh, so differentiable rendering to sort of move these, the hand model and the object model together, and then temporal optimization. Uh, so, uh, so it turns out that uh, the details here matter. So if you, we did, we can do reconstruction of a hand or object separately, that's not so good, do them together is better. And then, then of course, enforce temporal continuity. Okay, so the right frame shows, uh, the, uh, the, the right column shows what happens when you use independent frames. So you really should be doing it in 3D and employing uh, temporal consistency. So there are lots of details, but the, the, these are some results. Okay, so because it's in 3D, I can give you views from different directions. Okay, and we've not just done it for one case, but hundreds, okay. And uh, there are some cases where it fails, and typically if you didn't, it didn't the, the, some part of the vision pipeline failed, you didn't segment the object correctly, things like that. You don't have a correct CAD model. But, uh, but anyway, that's the, then how do we imitate object interactions? And uh, the challenge here is that the human hand and the robot hand don't have the same morphology, right? The human hand is five fingers with lots of degrees of freedom. The robot hand may just be a parallel jaw gripper. So, uh, so this is a challenge. So the secret is don't focus on the hand, focus on the 
object. So the object must go through the same trajectory. That's our, the idea. And you specify the reward in terms of the trajectory of the object. And now the robot has to do what it does, taking into account its morphology. So the reward functions are, there's a phase which is lift the object off the table, bring the object to first pose, and then imitate the rest of the trajectory. And the rewards are shown in this, which are basically like, uh, okay, some kind of difference in orientation between uh, the position of the object as when being manipulated by the robot versus what the human did. And, uh, and then we, we have some of the results. So here it's being done like a separate task is being solved for each of the, each of the, the hundred, whatever different things. And uh, I think that this needs to be compressed. So we need to scale to many videos. We need to have real world experiments. We have one basic one, but there should be one policy for all videos. And, uh, and this is a summary and uh, this paper is available online. I want to conclude with, uh, with uh, in two minutes by uh, more philosophical remarks, which is uh, how should we be doing these thinking about these things? So I, I take uh, the evidence from child development very seriously. And in fact, this idea goes back to Turing, which is that we should uh, essentially build up an AI system by imitating the stages of child development. And children learn by multimodal stuff. They learn by interacting. They learn by observing. And uh, there's a very nice summary of this from by this paper by Smith and Gasser. This summarizes uh, basically decades of work done by our psychologist colleagues, uh, which says that starting as a baby grounded in a physical, social, and linguistic world is crucial to the development of intelligence. And there's some features here, which I think we should be adopted in robotic learning. First is multimodal, not just vision, but also vision and touch, vision and proprioception, et cetera, et cetera. Incremental, learn from the, build up a representation and then use it in the next stage rather than just do everything uh, vanilla and from uh, fresh. Uh, be physical, uh, I, I think these things, physics matters. So intelligence is not just generating words, uh, even if you think uh, that chat GPT is all there is to intelligence. And there is, uh, the, 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 it, it, to me, intelligence, there's a big component of intelligence, which is spatiotemporal intelligence, which is uh, vision and uh, perception and action, broadly speaking. And then there is an aspect of intelligence, which is more socio-cultural, which is where uh, language comes in. And they're both important. Anyway, for human babies, uh, physical, explore, be social. So I don't have to learn just from my experiments. I can learn from observing others' experiments. And then finally, language, but only at the end. And thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what is the question? So it is semi-supervised, I would say, because you have a, you know, you picked the model uh, in in the, the the early stage. We have knowledge of the object model, so some kind of a CAD model found from the web. So the, I, eventually, this should the, this uh, this assumption should not be there. Well, uh, yeah, so, so if the object is of a type that you have seen before, then you're okay. But uh, it should scale to any object. And I think that this will happen. I think that uh, this is basically another couple of years of work from the 3D computer vision community and we'll solve this. So uh, uh, my slogan for this, which I've been saying for the last 10 years is, we need to be able to 3 d everything. So even from a single image. So when I look at this chair, I don't see the chair as just a flat set of pixels. I see the chair as a 3D object which is articulated in some form. How do I know that? Because sometime in the past, I actually saw that chair from multiple angles and I did a 3D reconstruction. 
And of course, there's generalization across chairs. So from our visual experience of multiple views of objects, we build models of everything such that we can subsequently, even from a single image, lift the, lift the, lift the image to 3D. So I believe, I mean, there's a capability humans have, and basically there's a very clear sequence in human babies. Start with motion, add binocular, thirdly, have the ability to do it monocularly, and they can do it by like nine months. Our computer program should be able to do this for any object. I think all the techniques are there. We just need more data, and it'll happen. I think I, do, I give it like two or three years, and it'll be done. And there's lots of interest because of all the AR, VR business, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, we actually have a slight change to the schedule. So for unforeseen circumstances, Kristen actually won't be giving a talk. Um, so we actually have extended question time, actually, if that's okay with okay. you, Sandra. <laughs> I, 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 I have to give another talk okay. in half an hour, but before that, I'm okay. Perfect. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, and ask, uh, when someone asks a question, do you mind please repeating uh, just for the- Okay, yeah, I got it, got it, yeah. Yeah, so any other questions? Yeah. yeah thanks for the talk. So uh, in the first part, we were kind of <coughs> proposing this uh, uh, one visual embedding to learn for all time. Yeah. But in the, in the, in the end, you ended up talking about the kind of interactions are important, language is important. So how do you think that these two things come together? Well, uh, it, this is research, right? So, uh, so, so the the yeah, so that means that the answer is all of the above. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I want to state a few things, right? So, at the end, what I stated was what we the richness of of development that we know from uh, psychology and biology. Okay. So, what it's saying is that there are many different modes in which children learn and how. One mode of learning is layered on another mode of learning and so on. So I wanted to get that point across, which I think is a major source of inspiration for me. Okay, then, uh, then you start to concretely operationalize this. And I mean, so these are two projects which concretely operationalize it. And uh, they are focusing on different aspects of the problem. Okay, one is essentially focusing on how do we learn from others? And how we are claiming that how we do we learn from others is by observing an interaction. So this is on the action part, basically. The action part, what we do is I observe you performing an action. I lift it to 4D. Okay, that's a claim. You, somebody might say, oh, I don't need to lift it to 4D. I'm going to make that claim that we lift it to 4D. And uh, we do the recovery, and now that becomes training data for an RL policy, but it's much easier to train RL with dense reward than sparse reward. So that project, so that, that is, I think, a coherent way to think about how we learn to imitate actions. But then there is this other aspect, which is anytime you go to do a task like navigation or manipulation or whatever, my vision system is not being trained to do that task alone. I have like a generic vision system. So my, again, my example is a 16 year old who learns driving has a much better vision system than all our vision systems for self-driving cars after a billion miles of driving, okay? Or in fact, a two year old kid manipulating some objects like peas and bananas and uh, Lego blocks. It's using, so, it has a vision system when it is trying to learn the task. And these motor tasks are difficult. Why do we send kids to school at the age of five and not three? One of the big things is just the ability to hold a pencil and manipulate it is challenging. But that child, when is mastering the skills of manipulating a pencil, which he or she masters at the age of five, has a vision system which is probably good enough for it at the age of two. And I'm focusing on that part of the problem. And this is one model. I don't know whether, I mean, we'll see over time what, whether it stands the test of time. I think there are more things to be done. I'm, I'm just, I don't want to limit it to like, I mean, these are two projects which I think capture very important aspects of the whole problem. Yeah, Ivan. Yeah, so, um, so you create parallel 
about the children. The children, I guess, for the first few years, they are still safe. And in our terms, they're doing the training. So they're not seeing hundreds of thousands of hours of ego coding, but they are like they are interacting with our system. So I think that for free training interaction is uh, easy. So uh uh I mean, I, I don't know the answer to how much is uh, from interaction and how much is from third person observation. So both play a role, right? So there are, when you do it by interaction, what you're learning you do by interaction is more powerful because you have the perceptual signal and you have your proprioceptive sense. You know all your joint angles and so forth when you're doing the task. So as a training problem, the examples that you collect from interaction are more powerful, more rich in terms of the, the data. And then of course you can have the chance of doing active learning in the sense that you can uh, explore the right parts of the space. So interaction data is golden, right? But you have a limited amount of interaction data and 10X or 100X or 1000X amount of observational data. And I think that there are many things that we learn just by observation as well. So that kid of 16 who's learning to drive, uh, until 16, she hasn't got that interaction data. But she actually probably learned the laws of traffic and how you exit and uh, how you do lane changes by just observing mom or dad doing this. So I, I, I feel that it's not an either or. I think both are needed. I think interaction data is golden, but you will always have much less of it. Observational data is, uh, so one is like platinum and one is like gold, <laughs> okay? And you'll just have to make do with, so I think systems should be developed which exploit both. I mean, you're always, I, I mean, if you have young children, you would have noticed how there are many things which they've learned just by observing. And so they get it right the first time round. I mean, because they uh, they had the component skills and then they just had to do that. Okay, yeah. Um, so I guess the, the quick question is how do you get quality? Yeah. Yeah. So I I think that's a that's a that's a great problem, and uh, I I feel that there we should do it in a two stage fashion, and uh, uh, for the first stage is do it in simulation, because I I want to put it this way, uh, which is uh, if your approach doesn't even work in simulation, it probably won't work in the real world. Okay, so at least do that sanity check. And I remember this discussion with, uh, I think maybe with Jan or Jeff about uh, the value of MNIST. And one of the things that we were chatting about was if your approach to recognition doesn't even work on MNIST, then it probably is not worth trying because there's a standard criticism of MNIST. Oh, this is the not 3D, it's flat, it's segmented out, et cetera. But if your approach doesn't even work on MNIST, then let's not worry about it. Okay, so it's a, so I feel that a lot can be done with simulation. The technology for simulation is improving rapidly every day, right? I mean, the, I, I, I mean, I worked on a few different problems where, where starting in simulation, navigation, indoor navigation for a mobile robot. Basically the stuff just worked out of the box, uh, you know, trained in simulation and then it worked in for real world obstacle avoidance. Yeah, there were some failure modes like objects on the floor, but generally it worked. We did some work on uh, walking robots. Again, trained fully in simulation. There needed to be a cleverness about how to do the sim to real. Again, it worked. We did some stuff on dexterous manipulation. So I, I, have, I started out like five or six years ago. I used to be... Uh, if somebody had asked me in, and in a conversation, I would have said, I hate simulation, real, real men don't use simulation, you know, that kind of stuff. 
And I see that attitude in the robotics community still, but uh, in my view, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, sort of kind of uh, blind and not taking into account the progress that has been made. I'm not saying it's universal. Eventually we want tests in the real world because, uh, but as there's an old saying, right? All simulations are wrong, but some simulations are useful. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I think you should give people a limited amount of rope. It's like you, you say, okay, you do this and then within two years, show it to me on a real robot and then, then I'm okay. So you can have an extreme, which is that you'll never ever be on a real robot, then it's pointless. So, but I think there's a, you give people a little bit of rope and I think that you have to judge just that, that this looks close enough. Some things it's, so I, I, I feel that once you're in the business, you know what works in where the simulators are good or bad. So deformable objects. Okay, I wouldn't trust your physics simulation for that, right? So I, there are lots of things where I wouldn't trust the simulation. Uh, in vision, we have a very clear answer, which is you simulate with RGB versus simulating with RGBD. So the RGBD stuff in a simulator usually transfers quite well, but RGB doesn't. And RGB also is very slow to uh, train in a simulator. So, so there are these little rules of thumb or heuristics that people who've been in the business have acquired. And I think uh, it's a journey. I mean, it'll get better. I'm an optimist. Okay, I think maybe people should have coffee rather than listen to me more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's time to speak up. Uh, so, hi, I'm Siddhant Alder, and I'll be presenting a work titled Watch and Match Supercharging Imitation with Regularized Optimal Transport. This is joint work done with Vaibhav Mathur, Dennis Yarats, and Laryl Pinto at New York University. So, imagine you want to teach a robot to do one of these tasks. I'm sure none of us would want to spend hundreds of hours to teach these skills to a robot, only to have it go to waste the moment the scenario changes. So our goal in this work is to minimize the time and effort required to teach these skills to robots. So how should we teach our robots these skills? A common way of teaching something to someone is through imitation. So an, an imitation rests on the principle of watch and match. Watch what someone else is doing and match their actions. A popular way of doing imitation learning is behavior cloning, where uh, an expert makes a robot interact in the environment to collect some demonstrations, and you train a policy on this using supervised learning. However, though these methods seem to work well, they tend to require large amounts of data, which in turn needs a long time to collect. And since we want to minimize the amount of time required to teach these skills, let's look at what happens when we do behavior cloning on small data sets. So consider the task of opening a box. We, here we provide a single expert demonstration using a joystick and train a behavior cloning policy on this demonstration. So we observe that the BC policy uh, successfully completes the task when you start from the same initialization as the demonstration. However, if the, demo, uh, if the initialization varies even by a little bit, the BC policy struggles. And this is a commonly known problem with behavior cloning referred to as the distributional mismatch problem. So a uh, uh, fix for this is to just fine tune this policy using online learning in the environment. So given an expert and an agent trajectory, we use an encoder to uh, obtain a trajectory of encodings. Now this use of an encoder is necessary because directly learning policies on these high dimensional visual spaces is difficult. So we reduce it to a lower dimensional representation. Now, given these trajectory of encodings, we use an optimal transport-based matching scheme in order to obtain a similarity measure between these trajectories. And uh, this matching score is used as a reward to do inverse RL in order to fine-tune this policy. Now, though this pre-training plus fine-tuning scheme seems to be somewhat reasonable, it's like naively combining offline pre-training with online fine-tuning does not work very well. And this is something that's been studied in previous literature, and you can refer to these papers to see why this is the case. So um, to solve this problem, we propose our algorithm, regularized optimal transport, where we do online fine tuning with BC regularization. So our objective consists of a RL loss, which is a Q-learning based loss commonly used in off-policy uh, RL approaches. 
and we add a bc regularization term to this to keep the policy close to your expert data distribution however always regularizing your policy can bias it towards the expert data which might be undesirable so we add this adaptive weight which is supposed to regulate the amount of regularization you're adding during different stages of the online learning process. This is our simplified loss function. And the idea is to keep the policy close to the expert data distribution when your behavior cloning policy performs better than the current online policy. And uh, in order to compute the adaptive weight, we use this equation where lambda is basically the proportion of states where your behavior cloning policy performs better than the uh, current policy. And the idea again is to just increase the amount of regularization applied as, as your, uh, the behavior policy performs better than the rot policy. So let's put this in the context of the task of opening a box. Like behavior cloning, rot succeeds when starting from the same initializations. However, now rot also succeeds when you start from any initialization in front of the box uh, as opposed to behavior cloning. And uh, we evaluate our approach on a set of uh, three environments, weeds, DM control, open air robotics, meta world benchmark, and these are our results. And we observe on average 7.8 times faster imitation as compared to prior work. We also evaluate our approach on a suite of 14 real world tasks. Uh, for all of these tasks, these, uh, these high dimensional RGB images are given as an input and the policy is expected to spurt out the uh, end effector positions. For each task, we provide a single expert demonstration and uh, limit the amount of online training to just one hour. And um, so, yeah, these are our results. And as you can see, ROT significantly outperforms behavior cloning and prior adversarial IRL based approaches. Uh, our work does have some limitations. One is that we need expert demonstrations since the only signal given to the policy about the task to be performed is the demonstrations. Suboptimal demonstrations here lead to suboptimal actions. And uh, the second is that the model struggles in cases where the task features aren't visually distinct. Let's understand this through an example. This is the task of placing a peg in a cup, and this is an expert demonstration that was provided. And this is a failure mode in the learned policy where the peg is placed behind the cup. So if you see these two frames, you can see that uh, they are visually very similar and it's difficult for the model to tell them apart. But uh, however, it must be noted that we do not use any pre-training schemes for our representation learning side and using them should help alleviate these problems. So this is our approach, regularized optimal transport. Some key takeaways are that we learn from high dimensional images. We learn with a single hour of online training and just a single expert demonstration. And our video and open source code are available at this link. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kaylee and I will be presenting robust manipulation from spatial features. This is joint work with uh, Tian He Yu, Chelsea Finn and Carol Hausman. So we're motivated by the theme of the workshop which is to better leverage pre-training for robotics. But in robotics, we don't have the same scale of data as in computer vision or natural language processing. We still wanna amortize the cost of learning as much as possible. And one way of doing this is to pre-train just visual representations where we have abundant data already. We can then use those features uh, to train policies on top of downstream. We expect this process to give us features that can generalize across reasonable distribution shifts that we may encounter like changes in lighting or object appearance. But in practice, the policies learned on top of pre-trained visual features can be very sensitive to even subtle distribution shifts. Our goal in this project is to understand the properties of visual representations that enable robust zero-shot transfer under these visual distribution shifts. To that end, we train policies for opening and closing a sliding cabinet within the Franca kitchen environment and evaluate their performance under the suite of visual distribution shifts. 
which we've adapted from the Kitchen Chip benchmark. We're looking at three different changes to the texture of the sliding door cabinet and four different lighting changes. We compare three models. The first two models are trained on manipulation relevant data. These are Mast Visual Pre-Training or MVP and R3M. The third model, Dyno, is a transformer-based model with a distillation loss. A notable property of Dyno is that the attention heads learn to segment emergently. Recent work has also found that Dyno makes more shape-biased classification decisions than an equivalent ResNet model. Because both MVP and R3M are trained on manipulation-relevant data like EGO4D, we would expect them to be more robust to visual changes within a manipulation task. Surprisingly, learning on top of Dyno enables much stronger zero-shot transfer performance. We train MLP policies on top of the given features with behavior cloning in the original kitchen environment and evaluate zero-shot in each transfer setting. Following the protocol from R3M, we train policies across three seeds, three camera angles, and three levels of demonstrations. Here we can see the success rate in each transfer environment with error bars showing standard error across seeds. Dyno outperforms R3M and MVP in each transfer setting and outperforms the next best method by two times on average across test environments. To further understand our results, we can visualize the attention heads for MVP and Dyno. MVP is on the top and Dyno is on the bottom. Interestingly, the Dyno attention heads we select localize the target object, which is the sliding door handle. In this particular example, the attention head remains consistent across viewpoints as well which is seen on the far right. By contrast, the MVP attention heads pick up on a lot of background objects, which may lead to spurious features in the resulting policy. To further investigate the relationship between the success of Dyno and the segmentation quality of the attention heads, we conduct an experiment where we only train with one of the attention heads in the last block of the network. On the right, we visualize two different attention heads from the last block of a dyno trained vision transformer before any task training or task fine tuning has occurred. Some of the attention heads provide highly task relevant segmentations, even without seeing any kitchen simulation data, while others attend to less relevant parts of the image, which is on the right. The maximum success rate in the original environment is 13% greater than training with all of the attention heads and 32% greater than training with a randomly selected head. As an important caveat, we have only found these results to hold in limited settings, like from certain camera angles and with a limited num number of demonstrations, but we hope to continue improving on these results in the future. Uh, finally, to summarize, we find that visual representations trained with a shape bias network, like Dino, can outperform representations trained explicitly for control under distribution shift. The attention maps of Dino provide task relevant segmentations both before and after training. So that's without having any task relevant data or even simulation data. And under specific camera angles and with limited data, we do find performance can be improved by masking out heads that attend to task irrelevant parts of the scene. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk. If you have any questions, feel free to visit our poster or email us. Hi, everyone. This is Tong Zhou Mu from UC San Diego. I'm going to present our recent study on pre-training on visual motor control, revisiting a learning from scratch baseline. This is joint work with Nicholas, Zhe Chen, Yan Jie, Erwin, Hao, Hua Zhe, and Xiaolong. So recently, large-scale pre-training becomes widely successful in computer vision and NLP, right? With large model and large set, it definitively improves the performance in most tasks when compared with learning from scratch baseline. Encouraged by the success from CV and NLP communities, we, the robot learning people, start to think about the role of pre-training in robotics. And that's why 
we are here today to organize the workshop of pre-training for robot learning, right? There are a bunch of recent works like PVR, MVP, and R3M. They learn visual representations from large out of domain data sets and then learn a policy head based on the frozen visual representations. Their result shows that these learned representations is capable of training successful policies um, despite large domain gap. However, we want to ask such a question. Does it definitively improve of learning from Square's baseline? And this becomes our motivation. In our work, we try to build a strong learning from scratch baseline so that we can accurately benchmark the progress in this area. Specifically, in this work, we propose a learning from scratch baseline, which is actually pretty simple. It uses appropriate data augmentation and a shallow ConvNet encoder. This learning from scratch baseline can be combined with a different kind of policy learning algorithm for example, imitation learning or reinforced learning. To evaluate our proposed baseline, we consider three algorithm classes, behavior cloning of policy IL and on-policy IL. We test them on three different domains, adroit, DM control, and PIXMC, and we report multiple matrices. We compare our proposed method with three pre-trained visual representations. PVR, MVP, and R3M. Basically, they do self-supervised learning on large-scale datasets of out-of-domain images. Surprisingly, we find that a well-designed learning from scratch baseline is actually very competitive. It performs comparably or even works better with those pre-trained methods. And the key here is to use data augmentation, which is very critical to the performance of learning from scratch baselines. And based on the about re results, it seems pre-training does not really help too much. Then maybe we want to ask, where do we expect pre-training to help? Maybe it should help visual generalization, right? So we do the following experiments. We test the visual robustness of the trained agent by benchmarking them on DM control generalization benchmark. So basically, in this benchmark, the visual appearance of agents or background are changed in the test set. And we found that the use of data augmentation is also very critical in this case. Uh, it's very critical to the robustness of learned agents for both learning from scratch and using frozen pre-trained representations. So basically, without augmentation, nothing performs very well consistently. So far, it seems pre-training is not as useful as we expected. However, we still remain optimistic in above experiments, all the pre-trained representations are all frozen. So we want to try fine-tuning them using uh, task-specific data and see whether it works well. And we find that the pre-trained representation improves slightly over frozen representations and learning from scratch approach. But only when also using data augmentation during fine tuning. This again shows the importance of data augmentation. So to summarize in our study, we found that frozen pre-trained visual models do not yet definitively outperform well-designed learning from scratch baselines. Second, the use of data augmentation is critical to robustness of learned visual representations. Third, Fine tuning representation on task specific data improves in performance. Fourth, using frozen pre trained visual representation can lead to improvements in war time. For more information, please stop by our poster. Thanks so much for listening. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Carl Perich. Today, I'll present our work on assisted teleoperation for scalable robot data collection. Um, for many of the more recent results in robot learning, we actually require very large data sets to make them work. Um, just this week, the people from Google Brain published a paper where they used 100,000 plus demonstrations, and collecting those demonstrations is quite challenging. 
uh, because how do we collect demonstrations nowadays? Um, it pretty much looks like this. So basically there's a human, um, they teleoperate a robot and that's like the best way to get uh, meaningful long horizon trajectories, which we can use for training. But clearly that doesn't scale very well. It's pretty tedious. Uh, you need to employ a lot of people who actually just do teleoperation. So uh, in this project, what we asked is, is there a way we can do better by using learning? And there's actually some evidence um, that that could be the case from other fields uh, where collecting labels is pretty expensive. For example, semantic segmentation, um, where people have spent quite a bit of effort into automating part of that system so that they can, for example, have a model that proposes a rough segmentation and then have the human only correct it in order to be more efficient. And so what we'll do here is quite similar, but in the case of teleoperation. So the core idea is that we want to kind of automate part of the teleoperation that is repeated and not that interesting so that the human can better spend their effort uh, and collect data more efficiently. And so we are training an assistive policy that basically helps the human teleoperate. Um, and then the critical part here is to figure out basically when uh, should that policy ask the human for input? When is it unsure about what to do next? And so the way this works is pretty simple. Um, so we assume we have some previous data set that we have collected, which we can use to train our policy, and we want to collect more data that's different from that data set. And you could imagine even starting without any data and then kind of iterating that loop where you collect some data, retrain your policy, and so on. But let's assume we can uh, train our policy from some existing offline data. Now, the core goal here is to automate repetitive behaviors while teleoperating. And then the critical part is figuring out when uh, we should ask for help. And that's why we need to estimate uncertainty of that policy. Um, so basically, when the policy is uncertain, uh, so, well, when the policy is certain, when it has low uncertainty, um, then it should just execute the task. Basically, it knows what to do here, so it will just do that part of the teleoperation. And then when it is uncertain, um, then it should ask the human for input, and only then should the human actually provide uh, input and needs to interact with the robot. And then we can repeat this uh, until we're happy with the size of our data set. So clearly, the critical part is when should the policy ask for help. Uh, and in this project, we identified two scenarios. Uh, on the one hand, when it's unsure about what to do next in terms of the task. Um, so basically, you know, it might know the state that it's in right now. It might know that there's a bunch of different things it can do next. Um, and then it should kind of ask the human, which of the things that I know how to do, should I actually do? And so the way that we are estimating this uncertainty is by training a hierarchical policy as our assistive policy that predicts sub goals that are, you know, a certain time horizon in the future. Uh, and then we can estimate the, uh, the, the uh, variance over the distribution of predicted sub goals uh, in order to figure out basically if the variance is high. Um, then it's probably pretty uncertain about what to do next. So we should ask the human for input. Um, and then the other scenario where we might want to ask human for input is if we're in an unfamiliar state. So basically, if we're in a state that our prior pre-training data set didn't cover, uh, then the policy doesn't really know what to do, so better ask the human what, what to do here. And in order to estimate that uncertainty, we're training an ensemble of low-level sub-goal reaching policies. Uh, and when that ensemble disagrees, is basically when we are assuming we're in an unfamiliar state, so we should better ask the human for input. All right, so these are the two conditions uh, when we switch to human control, and then we test this in a real world user study where we had a bunch of humans teleoperate a robot uh, on, on a task like this, where they need to put a bunch of blocks into a bunch of uh, receptacles, uh, receptors. Um, and so they teleoperate that, this remotely. Um, they uh, were asked for infrequent inputs whenever the robot needed help, and we also had them solve a side task so that we can measure their mental load. Basically, how much do they actually need to focus on the teleoperation part? Uh, to see whether our methods help them teleoperate more easily. And what we found here is that people were actually much more able to solve these side tasks with assisted methods. And then with our methods, they were able to uh, more optimally teleopt the robot because it uh, better asked for help in the right moments. Um, we also extended this to a study where a single teleoperator needed to teleoperate multiple robots. Uh, basically, the way this works is that multiple ro robots are doing teleoperation. And then whenever they're unsure what to do next, uh, they will essentially ask for human input with this kind of red marker field. Uh, and then the human can switch control between the robots and just teleoperate the one that needs help. And so what we found here, um, sorry, what we found here uh, is that with our assisted teleoperation system, we could essentially scale the teleoperation throughput uh, by having multiple robots, but just a single teleoperator. And we also closed the loop on this uh, and then trained on the demonstrations we collected and found that with the same amount of teleoperator effort, uh, we can get much more performant policies just because we can collect more data and the data is still high quality. All right, uh, to conclude this, basically we have introduced an assisted teleoperation system that makes teleoperation easier. A single operator can control multiple robots with that system and that drastically increases the demonstration throughput you can collect. For more details, please uh, come see us at our poster. You can go to our website and I do wanna point out that most of this work was done by Shivan who is a master student in our lab, 
and who's also applying for PhD this year. So look out for his application. All right, thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are happy to share with you DaliBot, uh, first work that uses uh, web scale image diffusion models for robotics. So at the uh, heart of our method is these uh, are these uh, image diffusion models that can generate amazing images uh, and uh, do it in a high quality from text, uh, from text prompts. Uh, and they've been trained on hundreds of millions of images from the web. So in the summer, we got access to one of these models and uh, we asked ourselves, how can we utilize these amazing models trained on massive data sets for robotic applications? And we found that they can generate uh, realistic, high quality images of scenes like kitchens and offices. And we can use in-painting functionality to place additional objects in semantically correct places. Therefore, we decided to, in this work, use it for object rearrangement and imagine placements for uh, uh, and uh, imagine placements for objects uh, to be rearranged. So the key idea of this framework, which we call DaliBot, uh, is this: the robot prompts Dali with the list of objects it detects, which generates an image with a human-like arrangement of these objects, and then the robot uh, rearranges uh, these objects with a series of pick and place operations to uh, realize the generated arrangement in the real world. We achieved this idea using a fully autonomous modular approach composed solely of off-the-shelf components and pre-trained models. It starts with the initial RGB observation uh, and uh, produces goal poses for all the objects in the scene that then the robot can move the objects to and realize the uh, generated arrangement. And now let's see our method in action. We tested it in uh, three different types of everyday scenes. Here you can see a, uh, a dining scene consisting of a plate, a fork, a spoon, and a knife. Uh, if moving the object to its goal position would result in collision, the robot first moves it out of the way and then continues rearranging the, uh, the arrangement that Dali imagined. And it can uh, create arrangements that are semantically correct uh, and reasonable. In this case, it realizes that cutlery needs to be placed in a certain order around the plate and creates the arrangement that is actually usable and preferable by humans. The next scene we tested on is the office scene. In this scene, uh, the robot is not allowed to move the iPad display, but needs to arrange the objects around it, uh, considering that it's already there. We do so by in-painting around, uh, around the iPad. And again, uh, Dali have seen many images of uh, desks arranged by humans and can imagine and create arrangements uh, of these desks that are actually usable without needing to specify any goal poses uh, by the user. And finally, we have a, a fruit scene with a basket, an orange, and two apples. Here, the objects in the scene has semantic relationship between them as well. Intuitively, uh, fruit should go inside the basket. And on the right, you can see the dolly generated image and the final arrangement that a uh, robot produced. And we use these images of the final arrangements to conduct a user study where we asked uh, human users how happy would they be if the robot created such arrangements for them? We compared it against other zero shot uh, rearrangement baselines, such as just randomly placing objects on the tabletop, aligning them in some uh, geometric heuristic way, and two other variants of uh, DaliBot. So the first variant creates the arrangement in the autoregressive way by placing one object at a time and in painting around already placed ones. And the second one uses the first DALI image without considering if it contains a correct number of objects or semantically reasonable uh, arrangements. And we saw that DALI bot, uh, the arrangements created by DALI bot were actually preferred by humans. And uh, it was actually 
the humans actually liked uh, and were happy with the arrangement that Dali created. And this uh, suggests that humans actually prefer semantically meaningful arrangements rather than just geometric, uh, geometrically aligned ones. We also did some experiments on completing the arrangements that are already started by humans. For this, we uh, asked uh, participants to create arrangements and removed one object at a time from them, and then uh, uh, used DaliBot to predict the pose for it. And as you can see here, DaliBot was actually able to infer uh, and complete the arrangement in a way that a human participant uh, did. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, DaliBot uh, can create human-like arrangements in a zero-shot fashion without needing to do any training or provide any demonstrations. Thanks to web-scale pre-training, it's not restricted to any specific set of objects, and it does all of this autonomous without needing to specify uh, goals or uh, any interaction by a human. Uh, if you have any question or would like to talk to us, please come to our poster and thank you. All right. Um... My name is Carl Parrish, so, uh, and I'm happy to present uh, a second work. Uh, this one is on scalable semantic policy pre-training uh, via language instruction relabeling. Um, to motivate this a bit, uh, I guess we have seen quite a few successes of RL over the past couple of years, uh, both in the real world and in simulation. Um, and as we all know, a core problem of all of these works is kind of sample efficiency of RL in general. And I think I don't need to convince anybody in this workshop uh, that one solution for that is policy pre-training. So basically taking some sort of offline scenario uh, pre-training our policy so we don't start from scratch uh, and hoping for improved sample efficiency. But a core question uh, in this policy pre-training scheme is where do the tasks come from? Where do we actually get the tasks that we can use for pre-training policies? And so there's a bunch of different approaches uh, that people have explored. Um, I guess very uh, popular these days is offline reinforcement learning, where we essentially assume uh, that the data either comes with rewards uh, or that whoever is designing the offline RL system also designs reward functions that they can use to relabel the data with rewards. And so clearly that's not super scalable because we need a human to define a lot of tasks in order for that to work. Now, there has been some work uh, that tried to mitigate this. Uh, this is called actionable models. It's work from uh, Google Brain people uh, last year or two years ago, uh, which is really cool in the sense that it doesn't require us to define any tasks because what they do is that they sample states from the data set that they have access to and define those as goals and then say that's the task that you should solve for pre-training. And so that's really cool because you can get a lot of different tasks that you can use for pre-training. Basically, every state is a goal. Uh, the downside is that by, you know, sampling random goals uh, in your data set, uh, you end up with a lot of random tasks that the agent needs to solve that you might not actually need uh, because you might not want to reach every different uh, state in your data set. So how can we get more meaningful tasks? Um, I think there has been some other work that looked into uh, how to scalably define meaningful tasks. Um, and they, what they used is basically natural language. So they took their offline data set and they relabeled that data set with natural language descriptions, which is great because you get a lot of meaningful tasks. You still don't need rewards because basically your task is defined by the human uh, with a natural language utterance. And uh, the problem here is though that you're kind of limited to the set of predefined tasks that the people have annotated and you can use this powerful idea of relabeling. So what we're trying to do in this project is basically use a similar language-based approach to get meaningful tasks at scale, but then combine it with this relabeling idea from actionable models um, so that we can get new tasks at training time uh, and increase the number of tasks we can pre-train on. So then we thought, how can we do relabeling in semantic space, basically in language space? And here, the idea is that we can use pre-trained large language models to do that relabeling for us. Basically, we can give them some annotations that the humans have provided uh, and then use a large language model to make new annotations, uh, kind of summarizing uh, or aggregating the instructions that we already have. So this is what our approach does. Uh, we call it Sprint for Scalable Pre-Training with Relabeling Language Instructions. Um, so basically, we start with a similar data set like in the last column I've shown, uh, where we have a data set with language annotations provided by humans. And then we can use that for some offline RL pre-training of our policy. So this is fairly conventional. Um, but then what we do is that we use a pre-trained large language model. Uh, I believe we do use GPT-3 here um, to basically take some of these annotations that people have provided and we um, summarize them or aggregate them into new annotations, basically new tasks. This is kind of like a relabeling approach, but in semantic space. And then we can feed those tasks into the policy pre-training loop um, to get a much more rich data set of pre-training tasks. And we can also do that across trajectories. 
uh, where we can link multiple trajectories together um, so that we get the most diverse uh, training task set that we can get. And once we have pre-trained, then we do the conventional fine tuning on a new unseen task uh, and hope that it will work better because we had so many pre-training tasks. So we evaluate this uh, in an environment where we can actually do semantically meaningful long horizon tasks. Uh, we choose the Alfred environment uh, because it has a lot of different household tasks. They have semantic meaning. And it also comes with data that conveniently does have language annotations. So we didn't need to collect that. Uh, and then we pre-train our agent on this data set. And then we test it on new unseen tasks um, to test whether it can basically do well uh, in a new task setting. And what we find is that basically our pre-training with this kind of semantic relabeled approach uh, achieves better zero shot performance. So we can out of the box solve more tasks uh, in the downstream scenario. Um, these can be very long horizon. Uh, so the agent can actually pretty reasonably do these long horizon tasks after being pre-trained. Um, and then we also do test fine tuning. And for that, we collect new tasks from users. So we basically ask users um, to make up new tasks given a video uh, of what um, an agent might be able to do in our environment. And these tasks are fairly long horizon. Um, we collect 10 of them. And then we train our agent across all of them and compare to these previous approaches I mentioned. Uh, and we, we can see that uh, the pre-training with the relabeled task set actually achieves higher performance in fine tuning. All right, to summarize this, um, basically what we have introduced is a scalable semantic pre-training approach that uses language models uh, for skill aggregation and cross trajectory chaining. Um, and results show that we are better at zero shot instruction following, but also at fine tuning on new unseen tasks. If you want more details on how exactly uh, we implement each of the steps, please see us, see us at our poster. And thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot for the in-person uh, speakers. Uh, we're now gonna swap over to the uh, virtual talks. So could the first virtual talk um, share their screen, please? Thank you. Hi, could you say something to check if we can hear the sound? Sorry, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, we can hear you. Great, you can proceed. Okay, perfect. Um, hello, uh, my name is Andre. I'm from the University of Toronto. And today I wanna give you a presentation on our work on self-supervised pre-training of 3D point cloud networks with image data. To start, I'll just give a quick motivation as to why we're interested in doing self-supervised pre-training at all. And that's ultimately that labeling is a lot of hard work. In 3D uh, scenes, this usually means that we need to manipulate our scene in three dimensions. We need to zoom, rotate, and pan our scene in order to focus on a subject that we're trying to label. And once we have that subject in focus, we need to either select uh, which points belong to the object and which points belong to the background or draw a 3D bounding box. And this is kind of our motivation for using raw 3D data or 2D data um, in order to improve the performance of our models. This is commonly done in 2D and 3D using a contrastive loss in contrastive learning. And the idea is, is we want to find embeddings and inputs which uh, we will consider as positive samples and we'll make those embeddings close. And other embeddings, which we would consider as negative embeddings, uh, we want to make those as far apart as possible. In 2D images, this is commonly done by taking a single image, cropping it into two separate images, applying some transformations, and using those node correspondences either at the image level or at the pixel level in order to generate um, our embeddings and to take those correspondences as positive samples and anything else as a negative sample. This also works in 3D with point clouds. Uh, we can either use a single point cloud or two point clouds which overlap and have been registered to each other. We can apply two different transformations and those are usually, let's say like a rotation. Those uh, create known correspondences either between points or between the point clouds themselves. And ultimately by learning these embeddings, we can free train our model for use in downstream 3D tasks. In our method, we wanted to see whether we could also leverage both of these at the same time. So we started first with images, which are commonly present with our 3D data. We applied the same transformations, which is commonly done by cropping and uh, changing the image. 
and we trained a 2D network with our known correspondences in this contrastive loss. Using these known features in our first stage, we were able to then train a 3D model using a point cloud which corresponds to the same image, apply a set of transformations, pass those through a 3D model, and use these frozen embeddings in order to pre-train the 3D model on its own. And when we looked at what those features look like, um, in our first stage, we can see that um, our features, which have been mapped down to a 1D color space using a, a TSNI approach, uh, that much of the features and much of the structures which are present in the image is also present in our feature map. In our first stage, for example, we can see that objects or floors and shelves are present between the two. In our second stage, uh, when we're trying to map our 2D features into the 3D space, we can see that um, many of the structures are actually mimicked by our 3D model. In this case, for example, shelves or even the floor tiles, which we can see in the bottom image. And so as a sanity check, we kind of can see that the model is learning structures from the raw 3D and 2D data. This is in comparison to a completely uninitialized or untrained model, where much of the data is completely random. On the right here, for example, you can see our pre-trained model has uh, feature weights, which are much smoother and are following object boundaries uh, much better than anything which is uninitialized. The idea here being that this initialization should be able to uh, improve performance on downstream tasks with uh, fewer labels. In order to evaluate this hypothesis, um, we compared our, our method against um, three separate pre-training methods, all using points only. And we ran against uh, on four separate, um, four separate data sets. And we looked at semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, and object detection. We found that in almost all cases, we were able to improve upon baseline results, uh, especially in the case of using only single scans as opposed to multiple scans which are registered to each other. We were able to outperform previous methods and compare comparably to other multi-scan methods. So in comparison, we present a image point cloud pre-training framework where we leverage the feature richness of images to learn pixel level features and use those as a target in our contrastive loss to train a 3D model. And we found that this does indeed improve performance on downstream point cloud tasks. Thank you. Um, so hope everyone can hear me. So the next talk will be by Jason Ma and it will be a pre-recorded talk. So I'll just share my screen and play the videos. Uh, can the live audience just confirm, young if you can hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason. Today I will be talking about VIP a goal condition value function pre-trained on diverse human videos that can zero-shot provide visual dense reward and representation for unseen robotics tasks. A generalist home robot needs to be able to learn an expanding set of tasks in diverse visual scenes and improve their existing skills. To do this, the robot needs to be equipped with a generalizable visual reward function and representation. A plausible path towards this generous robot is training a goal condition and temporal value function that captures the temporal distance between two frames. Learning this value function automatically enforces learning a rich virtual representation, and the value function itself can be used for zero-shot reward specification for new tasks specified via goal images. However, the key bottleneck is that in-domain task-specific robot data are inherently scarce and expensive to collect. Consequently, there may not be enough robot data for pre-training and generalization. To overcome this issue, we propose training the goal condition value function on human videos, which are easy to obtain, diverse, and are naturally goal-directed. So our key idea is to frame pre-training on human videos as a big offline goal condition reinforcement learning problem of learning human policies. However, because human videos do not contain action labels, this cannot be achieved in practice. 
or key insight is that despite the fact that the primal problem of learning a human policy cannot be solved due to the lack of action labels, the dual problem of learning a value function does not depend on actions enabling pre-training of human videos, but just sampling initial, middle, and goal frames from video sequences. In practice, we show that the value function can also be implicitly represented as an embedded distance, resulting in value implicit pre-training. In summary, VIP ingests diverse in the wild human videos and learn a visual representation whose embedding distance can be interpreted as an optimal goal condition value function extracted from human videos. Then this embedding is frozen and it provides visual reward and representation for unseen robotics tasks solved using various visual motor strategies. We conduct extensive experiments, both in simulation and the real world to validate VIP's effectiveness as zero-shot visual reward and representation. We compare VIP to prior state-of-art pre-trained visual representations for control. For each frozen representation, the embedding reward is the embedding distance difference of the next frame to the current frame. Here, we present our simulation results. On both trajectory optimization and online RL, VIP substantially outperforms all prior methods and is the only method that makes non-trivial progress on the hard setting. Here are some trajectories generated by VIP against the baseline. As seen across various viewpoints, VIP is able to correctly guide the trajectory optimization into discovering valid solutions, while R3M's trajectories are unsmooth, unsafe, and do not solve the task. Finally, we present our real-world offline RL results. Deploying offline reinforcement learning for real-world robotics is challenging due to the requirement for large offline data set, dense reward, hyperparameter tuning, and more difficult implementations. However, with VIP, we can overcome these challenges with a very simple algorithm, VIP reward-weighted regression. Compared to standard BC, we simply upweight transitions according to the reward computed by VIP. This enables the policy to pay attention to keyframes for solving the task and endows the ability to improve over the offline data set behavior. Across four distinct manipulation tasks and a suboptimal offline data sets of nearly around 20 trajectories, VIP RWR significantly outperforms all baselines, including using VIP for PC, notably training VIP policies just using SCARS in domain data set completely fails, highlighting that pre-training is necessary for future offline RL and the VIP is uniquely effective for it. In particular, VIP is able to learn recovery behavior through offline RL. This behavior is not present with pure behavior cloning approaches that do not use reward information. In summary, VIP introduces a mathematical foundation for universal reward and representation pre-training from diverse offline out-of-domain data. It is the first demonstration of successful in the wild reward specification and the first demonstration of practical few-shot offline RL in the real world. Thank you for listening. Great, and uh, for uh, all the participants, if there are any questions, you can leave them in the feed loop chat and then the resp respective paper authors will respond over there. Uh, the next presentation is uh, again going to be a pre-recorded talk and I will play it again. Hi, I am Gao Yuzhou, a master's student at CMU. Today, I will introduce our benchmark providing shared hardware for evaluation, which we call Train Offline, Test Online, or TOTO. This is a collaborative effort between CMU, UC Berkeley, University of Washington, NYU, and Stanford University. In the TOTO framework, we provide a real-world dataset collected on our hardware. Remote users train offline policies of their choosing on this data. They submit these policies for evaluation on our real-world setup. The evaluation results guide future iterations of method development. These evaluations form a leaderboard, giving direct comparisons on shared tasks, data, and hardware. Here's our robot setup. 
We have one seven degree of freedom frame capanda robot arm and one RGBD real sense camera providing image observations. Our data set consists of the following components at each time step. The proprioception state specified as current joint angles, actions specified as target joint angles, RGBD image observations, and reward. Our training data set contains two tasks, scoping and porting. Here, we show representative trajectories with varied objects, materials, lighting, and target locations. We can see that both tasks require changes in orientation of the gripper, which makes an effector control using only target locations insufficient for solving our tasks. We measure the weight of the material successfully scooped or poured as the reward. Thus, both tasks have sparse reward. The initial release contains about 2,000 scooping trajectories and 1,000 pouring trajectories. The first question we will address with Toto is, what makes a good visual representation for robot learning? To answer this, we train behavior cloning policies on top of frozen pre-trained representations. We evaluate these policies on our shared hardware, and the results inform us about which representation works better. We evaluate five such visual representations, each contributed by remote users. We have two representations that are trained on our dataset, BYOL and MOCO, and we call these in domain. These are in contrast with more generic representations, MOCO trained on ImageNet, ResNet50 trained on ImageNet, and R3M trained on Eagle 40. Here, we show evaluations of behavior cloning with each representation. The best performance ones are the two in-domain models. Pouring requires more location precision than scoping. All methods see a small performance drop moving from trained locations to unseen test locations. Here are the quantitative results of our visual representation experiments. In general, the relative performance between models is mostly consistent across scoping and pouring, with MOCO in domain, the best performing one. We also observe that the performance on testing locations does not degrade significantly compared to training locations, showing that the representations have some generalizable notion of where the object is. We also asked Toto, what's a good method for offline policy learning? Remote users contribute four initial methods, behavioral cloning on successful trajectories, Bing, which selects action using nearest neighbors, IQL, which is an offline RL method, and decision transformers, which recasts offline RL as sequence modeling. Bing uses the BYOL model, and the other three methods uses the in-domain MOCO model. Here, we evaluate policy learning methods on scoping. Bing and behavior cloning perform the best, both of which uses in-domain visual representations as well as quasi-open-loop rollouts that predicts and execute 50 time step trajectories without replanning. Bing sees the biggest drop between train and test locations, which makes sense since they select actions from training dataset via k nearest neighbors. DT is unable to solve the pouring task in train or test locations. BC and IQL both see successes on test locations, but still experience a significant performance drop. Here are the qualitative results of our policy learning experiments. We observed that Bing performed the best on train locations for both tasks, although it fails to obtain successes on pouring test locations due to the precision requirement of the task. Meanwhile, all other methods also experience some level of degradation when moving on to unseen test locations, leaving one clear directions for method improving using Toto. We're soliciting additional baselines. Submit your favorite vision representation or policy learning method today. To learn how, please see our website, which includes details on our open source dataset and starter code. Thank you. Great, our next speaker will be Jesus. Uh, please go ahead and share your screen. Mm, mm, yes. Can you hear me? OK. 
Kate. So hello, my name is Jesus, and I will be presenting our work at Min Paris Tech. This is joint work with Tao Yu and Fabian Mota. The idea is to train an image encoder to later be used for vision-based reinforcement learning. So the motivation, of course, is that vision-based end-to-end reinforcement learning is very simple and efficient, and we present a simple pipeline to address this. First, we collect a data set of images uh, to train the encoder. Uh, for instance, as we show it here, this data set can be collected from a previously trained agent, but also uh, motion planning or even random interactions could work. Then we train the vision encoder from supervised computer vision objectives. And finally, we train the final reinforcement learning agent. So to train the encoder, we train just one single encoder from four uh, computer vision tasks simultaneously object segmentation, depth prediction, autoencoding of the objects only, and also the regression of a low dimensional state, which includes uh, coordinates of the object and other proprioceptive information of the robot. As you can see, the input to the, to the network are two images from two different cameras. Here are some qualitative results. I'll go quickly. These are the depth prediction this is the segmentation. We have five different classes. This is the reconstruction of the objects. And this is the state regression. So the black box here represents the 2D projection of the 3D coordinates that are predicted from the network. And here are the results of the final agent on three simulated error bench tasks. So we compare against an end-to-end -end baseline and we use the exact same algorithm from both methods. We use soft actor credit. So the, the algorithms are the same. The only difference is the input to the, to the agent. So for our method, we use the frozen encoder to convert the images into 64 dimensional vectors. Uh, sorry, very quickly. Yeah, so as you can see on the left, these are the pushing and reaching tasks, which are simpler. And as you can see, our method is much more sample efficient and it also reaches a higher final performance. So on the more difficult task, the sliding task, uh, you can see that the baseline doesn't make any progress. Uh, so here are some visual results of the sliding task. Uh, first, the baseline, which is not very good, and then we'll see the our method. So this is the results from the pre-trained code. So one advantage of working with a, such a pipeline is what we can make modifications very easily. And one simple idea that we present in the paper is to do a sim to real uh, transfer with texture randomization. So there are two different, uh, two extra steps that need to be done. First, texture randomization on the data collection process, and then data augmentation uh, during the training of the encoder. So here are the results on a simple reaching task. Now we haven't tried yet to transfer the, uh, the more complicated uh, contact-based tasks. And one possible addition to the pipeline could be to add an extra step where we fine tune the final agent in simulation with domain randomization. So varying things like uh, the size, the, the weight or the friction of the objects. And this is zero shot transfer. So we haven't trained the, uh, the robot in the we haven't fine-tuned the, the agent in the real robot. So thank you very much for listening. Hello. Uh, thank you. Can the next speaker please sit up?
Yep. Hi, my name is Marcel Hossing, and I'm a computer science PhD student from the University of Pennsylvania. And I will be presenting our robotic manipulation data sets for offline compositional reinforcement learning, which is joint work with Jorge Mendes, Cassandra Kent, and Eric Eaton. So let's have a look at our main contributions in this paper. We provide four offline RL data sets, each containing data from 256 compositionally related tasks. The data sets were collected using the Composite benchmark, which is a simulated benchmark for compositional reinforcement learning. Um, and second, we provide trained test split lists for multitask training to enable reproducible evaluation and comparability of results on the data sets. And finally, we demonstrate the utility of the data sets and show that current offline error methods uh, have trouble uncovering the compositional structure inherent to the Composite environments. So let's first look at Composite. In Composite, every task is constructed as follows. A robot arm needs to manipulate an object in order to achieve an objective, all while trying to avoid an obstacle. And each of these, what we call axes, contains multiple elements that can be switched out, leading to combinatorially many tasks. So for instance, we could have an EWA robot arm that needs to push a box while avoiding a wall. Here we could switch out the EWA arm for a panda arm in order to obtain a new task. Collecting data over and over even in simulation can be very expensive. And one of the main issues with the online compost suite is that it requires 2.6, uh, 2.56 billion time steps to learn all the tasks using an online learning algorithm like proximal policy optimization. With the data set contribution here, we want to enable more efficient pre-training that will allow us to use an order of magnitude fewer samples to tackle the benchmark. Um, therefore, each data set contains 1 million time steps per each of the 256 tasks in compost suite. To collect the data, we train a model for each task. And, uh, for each task, and the four data sets come as variations on the performance of the agents that collected the data. More concretely, we have an expert data set that contains data that was collected using agents, which would achieve 90% success on each task. And the medium data set contains trajectories from agents that were trained up to 30% success. The replay data set contains the replay buffers that are stored during training of the agents. And since replay buffers are usually larger than 1 million time steps, we subsample trajectories from those. And finally, we have a data set that contains only random transitions. Then we consider three different multitask configurations. Um, first, uniform sampling, in, which refers to a setting which all tasks are taken from a single data set. And we uniformly sample a trained test split of tasks. We then use the trained tasks to train the agent and the test task to test zero shot generalization. In compositional sampling, instead of taking all the data from one data set, we take a subset of the task from the expert data, but the remaining tasks from a different data set, like the random data set, which creates a data set in which an agent that can extract compositional structure from the expert tasks should be able to use that knowledge to solve the tasks that contain only random data. Um, lastly, restricted sampling is the hardest setting as it fixes a single element, uh, for instance, the EWA robot arm, such that the training only contains a single task of that element. And this is particularly hard because the agent needs to be able to extract information about the EWA arm from a single task during training and then be able to reuse that knowledge later during testing. In our experiments, we compare Sorry, in our experiments, we compare behavioral cloning and implicit Q learning on the data sets. And here are some of the results. Our results indicate that both baselines can get decent performance when trained on expert data and achieve some generalization. However, when trained in other settings, success rates are rather low. And that indicates that the agents can mimic the expert behavior of the data, but they are unable to extract the compositional structure, which would allow them to generalize to non-expert data. As a summary, we have introduced four data sets for offline composition reinforcement learning, as well as training settings and baseline results. The next steps for us are to model um, tasks of one of the robot arms in the real world, and then see if pre-training on multiple robot arms in simulation produces more robust policies that can be used for composition in the real world. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And the next speaker, please, Sagat, thank you.
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nicholas, and for the next few minutes, I will introduce our recent work on accelerating visual model-based reinforcement learning with demonstrations. And this project is joint work between MedAI and UC San Diego. So model-based reinforcement learning learns a model of the world from interaction data. By learning a world model, an agent can reduce its need for real environment interaction, which can be used for either planning or behavior learning. And this makes model-based methods potentially more sample efficient than model-free methods. However, models are learned from interaction data and not all data is equally useful for model learning. Just like in model-free RL, model-based methods are commonly initialized with random parameters and iteratively collect training data by doing exploration. For example, we here show interaction data from a random behavior policy in the three domains that we consider. While model-based methods can be sample efficient, their behavior learning is often bottlenecked by this exploration, especially when learning from sparse rewards. In this work, we ask whether the initial exploration bottleneck can be overcome with even just a handful of demonstrations. For example, demonstrations collected by a human via teleoperation. We find that as little as five demonstrations can dramatically improve the sample efficiency of model-based RL, but it requires a few extra steps. We propose MODEM, a framework for model-based RL with demonstrations. Our method and experiments are based on the TDMPC algorithm, but it can in principle be applied to any model-based algorithm. Our framework consists of three different phases, a pre-training phase, a seeding phase and an interaction phase. In the first phase, we pre-train the encoder and policy using behavior cloning on the provided demonstrations. We then collect a small initial data set for model learning using our pre-trained policy. While this pre-trained policy is unlikely to be very successful due to the limited data, it serves as a pretty good behavioral prior compared to a random policy. And then finally, we iteratively collect more data by planning using our model. And then we fine tune the model on data from all three phases. And during this stage, we aggressively oversample the demonstration data set. We evaluate our method on 21 challenging visual motor control tasks, most of which only have sparse rewards. And our model also takes high resolution images as input. Compared to a set of strong baselines spanning both imitation learning, model-free RL, and model-based RL, we find that our method solves these challenging tasks significantly faster. Starting from the TDMPC baseline, we add one component of our method at a time and show that each of the three phases are important for sample efficient learning with demonstrations, both individually and also jointly. So in this figure here, the gray curve corresponds to TDMPC without demonstrations. The brown curve corresponds to TDMPC with demonstrations by just naively appending them to the replay buffer. And then the red curve here corresponds to our proposed framework and all the other cur curves are ablations of each component of our framework. Our final experiment is particularly relevant for today's workshop. Here we evaluate the downstream task performance of modem using a frozen pre-trained visual representation. And we compare it to our default setting of modem that learns the representation in an end-to-end -end manner. We find that learning the representation end-to-end -end on task data generally works better, but a pre-trained representation still gives us pretty good results across the task that we consider. So overall, we we're pretty excited about the combination of model-based RL and human demonstrations, and we look forward to seeing in which ways the community can expand this framework. If you want to learn more about our work, please check out the, the link here or drop by our poster at the in-person poster session. All right, um, so I'm also presenting the next paper, so I will just continue. 
in this next presentation, I will introduce you to our feasibility study on transferring model-based reinforcement learning agents to unseen tasks. And no notably, these unseen tasks are distinctively different from the pre-training tasks. This work is done in collaboration with other um, researchers at UC San Diego. So in this work, we propose a framework for multitask pre-training and fine-tuning of world models. And we use Atari games as our test bed. Atari games are challenging, but also interesting in this transfer setting because of their great diversity in both the visuals, the game mechanics, and the actions. Our method works as follows. First, we pre-train n different world models on individual Atari games using offline reinforcement learning. By leveraging offline RL, we do not assume the data set to consist of expert trajectories, unlike, for example, behavior cloning. We then distill the N learned models into a single world model that can play all of the N games. We choose to learn the multitask model by distillation, as directly learning a model by multitask offline reinforcement learning uh, can be pretty unstable. Once we have obtained a multitask world model, we can use it as an initialization to quickly solve unseen games by doing a fine tuning on data collected uh, by interaction. To mitigate catastrophic forgetting during the online fine tuning, we retain the offline data set and jointly fine tune the model on both the target task as well as the pre-training task. Because not all pre-training tasks are equally relevant to the fine-tuning task, we assign weights to each task in an unsupervised manner based on the gradient cosine similarity to the target task. We implement our framework on top of Efficient Zero, which is a recent model-based algorithm that has demonstrated pretty strong empirical performance on this Atari 100K benchmark. We show that our framework improves the mean performance of Efficient Zero by 23% and by as much as 71% in one game. We perform an extensive set of experiments that analyze the conditions for positive cross-site transfer. For example, we investigate which components of the world model are transferable by selectively transferring only some of the components during fine-tuning. Here we showed the normalized score of agents as a function of environment steps. The DES brown line corresponds to learning all components from scratch. If we only pre-train the encoder, we get some improvement in performance. However, surprisingly, we find that pre-training the encoder accounts for only some of the performance gains. Actually, pre-training the latent dynamics model leads to the biggest improvements in sample efficiency. And finally, transferring the policy has limited influence on performance, presumably because pre-training and target games are quite different in, in the action space. For more information about this project, please out to check the please check out the link here. Or if you're attending the workshop in person, uh, please stop by our poster at the poster session. Thank you everyone for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Nicholas. And with that, let's thank all of the uh, Spotlight speakers, both virtual and in person. Uh, and we will be now transitioning actually to uh, the poster session. And then we will resume again. The last talk that was scheduled for the session would be moved to the next virtual session. Cool. Uh Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Joseph Lim. Uh, Joseph is an associate professor uh, in the School of Artificial Intelligence at KAIST, uh, which is the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, where he leads the Cognitive Learning for Vision and Robotics Lab, CLVR, uh, with research in robotics, computer vision, reinforcement learning, and deep learning. Uh, previously, Joseph was also an assistant professor at USC, um, the University of Southern California, uh, Joseph completed his PhD uh, at MIT with Antonio Toraba and also spent time as a postdoc with Bill Freeman and Fei Fei Li. Um, well, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about skill-based robot learning, 
uh, please take it away, Joseph. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and also, it's very good to be here in person and giving a talk. I haven't given a talk in public for so long. So let's see how it goes. It's very, but anyway, it's very exciting. Um, and today I'm going to talk about skill based robot learning. And um, so let's first take a look here. So in recent years, as we all know, we have seen many um, advancements in hardware so that it can actually perform many tasks even beyond human levels. And we also have observed the same in machine learning as well, and especially in reinforced learning as well too. So leveraging this, our goal is to solve this complex physical task, um, especially long horizon task. And if you look at them more closely, and if you think about it, in fact, um, this long horizon test come with a very high complexity and huge variations. For example, all tests have a huge variations, but also environments and also agents too. I found this on the web. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's something else. It's, it's... Is it okay? Okay, cool. All right. So, um, so this, oops. So this high complexity, of course, is one of the main reasons that why we cannot code um, everything up as humans. But also, it actually applies to the learning method as well. And the learning method basically suffer from this complexity and also simple efficiency as well. And this is especially particularly more problematic because we often deal with each new task more independently. And also data collection is usually done in an online manner as well, too. Right. Oops. I am sharing, I think. Okay. Sure. Oops. Hmm. Should I just rejoin? Can you unshare my screen to you? Yeah. But maybe I should stop this and clear to do it again. Okay. Yeah. Okay, All right. Okay, so um, so the question is how do, so I guess one thing we can first take a look at is how humans deal with this issue. So if you look at humans, um, so humans learn from prior experience as well. So for example, when the kids learn to manipulate objects, they actually learn from prior experience. And also same thing when we are doing cooking in a new kitchen and whatever, we can also use prior experience to execute whatever experiences we have learned pre previously and also even maybe demonstrations too. And we can call this as a, like offline experience. So effectively, how can we apply this to the agent is the, one of the main question to us. So in other words, how to transfer from offline experience to the, so that we can actually reuse them or curate them and also share them as well. So in our lab, we take multiple approaches to this, for example, like learning world models or learning representations, but more specifically in our lab, we care about this reusable skills. So today we're going to focus on this learning reusable skills and also utilize them for long horizon task. So in, for, especially for skill-based learnings, there are, um, of, uh, there are a few, things we have to consider first, how to get all these skills from various source, source. For example, like how do we, so maybe including like predefined skill set, or maybe even from offline experience or maybe including the external knowledge. So that's the first step like doing skill learning. And then on the second, second step, it would be applying how to apply these skills to downstream test, to our target task essentially. 
Um, and this can be related, we can also utilize many state of our um, field and method, including, you know, meta learning, deep reinforced learning, multitask learning, or even large language model, et cetera. And I'll look for, briefly go through some of these works we have been doing in our lab recently. Okay. So first, let's talk about how we can do skill extraction and downstreaming using offline data, it will, which will be the majority of the, our talk, my talk today. So this work was done by Carl and Youngun, who are actually sitting here as well, and they're also graduating or graduated already too. Um, so if you see them and at Coral, say hi to them. They might have a lot of interesting to, things to share. Um, also, they're in the job market too. So if you're looking for postdocs or whatever else, you, should, you can talk to them too. So let's first take a look at this video, okay? So if you look at this video, this is probably the house we have never been to, and also I've never been to either. But when we walk around, we can already execute multiple different skills, even though it's actually the house we have never been to. For example, we can enter the building and we can make a turn. And also we can traverse the hallway and climb stairs or climb down the stairs, et cetera. But not only that, if we look at further more, we get to a point. And if I ask a question, what kind of skills you can execute here, or moreover, what kind of skills you should execute here, we know that we can maybe make a short left turn here, a long right, right left turn, but we also know that we don't want to turn right here because we'll bump into the wall, right? So, so the main intuition I want to bring here is not only we can actually learn, we can utilize skills in the future task, but we can also utilize and extract skill priors from previous experiences. So again, the, from this larger scale of the offline data, we can also just prior experience essentially. We can extract these skills, okay, which is the, well, the one of the main main topics of this talk. But also, we can take buyers over all the skills when to when they are meaningful on which task and in which situations. Okay. So this is also same thing again in the kitchen situation too. So for example, we know how to throw the knife, right? But it doesn't mean we will throw a knife during the exploration. So knowing how to do doesn't mean we will necessarily explore them and try it out in the exploration stage. So that's basically the main idea of the skill prior. So putting it in the more diagram here. So we have large scale data set of offline data of all different kinds of demonstrations. So from this demonstration data, we can extract all these reusable skills, right? But not only just the skills, we can also extract that out all these skill priors. So in other words, when is the right time to explore and try this skill out when it is not a good time to do it? So it's like, even if, even if you're at a hallway you have never been to, you know you are not gonna turn right, even though you could, right? And then once we extract these skills and their priors, we can actually apply it to uh, downstream task during the efficient, uh, during the reinforced learning, learning for the target task because at that point during the exploration stage, you only try skills that's more important and have high priority based on the prior during the exploration stage. So it can become more efficient learning, okay? So what kind of priors can we learn? So again, if we are in the intersection and in the driving, right? So we can make it, we know we can make a U-turn here. We should, we can try left turn or right turn, but we are not gonna go straight or you're, gonna, you're not gonna make a short right turn here because, and also back it up, for example, because we know it's a bit dangerous. So everything we have learned about what's useful and what's actually important skills to perform in this intersection is called, we call it as a skill priors, okay? <clears throat> so the downstream models works like this. So we have skill prior models. First, we have uh, demonstrations. And this, from this demonstration, we can extract skills just by basically having encoder and decoder. So we can embed the trajectory into certain skill space, right? And from this skill space, um, we can encode them, but also on top of it, we actually extract a skill prior when given a state, when it's good to actually use the skill or not. And that's basically our skill prior here. Okay. 
And then once we have this, so in the, during the downstream reinforced learning for the target task, when we are actually doing, uh, basically we are training skill policy. So instead of outputting the action, just like a normal reinforced learning, we are outputting this a skill vector Z given a state, right? So this basically we are substituting the action to the skill here. And given this, uh, we can actually do reinforced learning as usual. But on top of it, we are actually applying this skill prior as a regularization term there. So not only that the skill policy is just outputting what skill to perform at a time, we regularize uh, based on this skill prior, maybe it's what, which term, but when it's good to execute which skill and whatnot. Okay. And this can be done very easily in terms of when we have modified the soft actor critic, so setting this uh, KL divergence between the policy output and then skip prior output. Okay. And we tested in the, uh, a few different environments here, including maze, uh, block stacking and kitchen. Um, and then we actually tested on the new task set here. So we, when we actually just do random skill prior, then obviously you can see that on the left side, it's a very noisy, but it's, it's just shown that on the right side, the learned skill prior has more temporally and also situationally coherent um, skills are picked here. Right? And also shown in the kitchen environment, we can see that the soft actor critic, so it's the soda model we tried, they can really not really learn anything to perform here, but um, our method, the one on the right side here, you can see it actually can perform pretty reliable uh, stages of task. So you can actually open microwave or move in the, move the kettle or turn on the micro uh, turn on the oven as well as open up the uh, shelf as well. Yeah, and then also you can take a look, you can also see that also in the qualitatively here too, uh, quantitatively here, okay. So our method actually outperf uh, outperforms all the previous method by far here. So um, in Spiral, uh, we have shown that basically we can extract this uh, from the task agnostic offline data, we can extract the skills, okay. But also we can use this as skill priors for downstream learning. And it can actually make reinforced learning much more efficiently trainable. Um, but what else can we do when we actually have this as skill extractions? Okay, is a question now. So we also apply this as skill extraction method. It's basically it's pretty much a similar kind of scheme to imitate demonstrations. So from here on, I will go very briefly. Um, so. So we can actually use these extractive skills to learn from demonstration, okay? So we have, so the intuition is that um, when we are beginner, we are trying, to, we are gonna try to mimic all these random small low level actions step by step. But if you're actually more advanced or intermediate um, agent, you can actually learn and think at a more higher level. So in other words, we, can, we will likely imitate skills rather than just the low level actions, right? Um, so obviously imitating with the skill is intuitive, but more importantly, um, it allows that we can learn from more fewer demonstrations and for a longer horizon task. And that's basically this another paper done by also Carl and Youngun as well. Um, so this is called a skilled. So now that we have, have this uh, spiral, we can extract all these skills from demonstrations, uh, from the prior experiences. So now we have a very tar target specific demonstration we uh, use this extracted learned skills and demonstration to get this all these demonstrated skills in this specific target demonstration. And we again use this uh, target specific skill posterior and apply to the downstream learning as well. Okay. The detail is I'm gonna probably just skip today, but basically we have this skill extraction just like a spiral I showed you earlier. And then there's a, this prior and posterior extraction from the target demonstration. And then we apply to downstream RL again, just like uh, all year as a regularization here with discriminator term here. Okay. 
And we also show that uh, when we use this extracted skills from task agnostic data, they can actually do much better, uh, they can uh, perform completely of all the other previous methods, including spiral as well, in terms of learning from demonstration from fewer data points too. Okay. So it can, it's shown that um, ours work much better when we have a little number of data points. So which makes sense because we actually learn and have basic skills itself can be actually acted as priors extracted from, um, from the test agnostic data. So we are taking advantage of those information here. Okay. And also it's just shown that uh, we have shown that also it can actually help this when we are actually doing incomplete, uh, when we have some incomplete demonstrations, uh, suboptimal data, we can also outperform and do pretty well on some of the demonstrations as well compared to our own work spiral. Okay. All right, so we talked about, um, we can actually use this extractive skills and this uh, prior or uh, one of the downstream tasks and also we can learn from uh, demonstrations too. So next thing um, we can actually do is uh, meta learning as well too. So um, we know um, that in, uh, well, I guess, so we know that in the skill-based learning, right? So one I just talked about, they are actually, we are trying to utilize this prior out of this test agnostic data for efficient exploration, right? So we use this prior to do efficient exploration. And um, so it actually has a faster adaptation compared to, compared to Scratch but it also requires many samples for new task. So when we are given a new task, we still require many samples. It's a downside of skill learning, but we can take advantage of what the meta learning is good for. So you can actually quickly learn using relevant task and apply it to the, um, apply it for the target task. So it, so the advantage of the meta learning is that it actually requires, it actually uses only fewer trial adaptations, but it's more limited to the short horizon and density word task. So taking advantage of uh, both method, so we can actually combine this uh, spiral, basically skill-based method and the meta learning, and we can actually just do, combine them so that we can learn and quickly adapt. And also, um, but we can also take, take advantage of this offline data, basically skills. So that's basically this is skill-based meta policy learning, simple, right? So I'm not gonna go into the details here, but just the high level intuition based on beta, combining this meta learning approach and this is skill-based learning. And then we can actually do much more efficient learning as well. Um, as you can see, the hours in the blue curve uh, performs uh, all the other all the other soda models, including ours as well. Right. Okay, so I talked about um, learning from demonstration with the skills, and also I talked about meta learning with the skills. And lastly, there is one last work, which is actually the paper presented in this coral. Okay, will be presented in this coral. Uh, so I will be more brief about this one. But as an intuition is this, as it is following. So when we are making a pasta, right? Humans, we actually plan abstractly to solve the long horizon task, right? So we don't actually plan at a low level, step by step. So we plan things at a much more higher level, and which means we at the scale level, right? So we have, for example, we can rinse, we can rinse uh, vegetables, and then we are going to cut vegetables, right? And then we are going to turn on the stove. And lastly, <clears throat> we are going to boil the noodles. So as you can see in this even simple cooking examples, all our planning and all, all this explanation about this task has been at the abstract level, even for this long horizon task, right? The main question of this project was about can robots plan abstractly? to solve long horizon task, you know, basically maybe more in a hierarchical manner, right? So again, going back to this spiral. So we basically, what we add is that from this tech, test agnostic data, and we are, we have this learned skills, 
And then combining this, what we actually, our goal is to learn this a skill dynamic model rather than action dynamic model, right? Usually we play with action dynamic model, right? When we are the planning and whatever, and we're even reinforcing, et cetera. But we actually utilize this a skill dynamic model to plan and also train the reinforced learning model on top of it. So that's a very, that's a very basic key intuition behind this projects and the details will come in the actual poster later days. Okay. So again, I guess, uh, I guess I have more slides about this somehow. So, um, so rather than plan everything at action level like this with action dynamic model, uh, which is not suitable for long horizon task, as you can imagine, because the, you know, the farther it becomes with action level, it becomes less accurate. And there's this, which means there is a huge planning budget. It's very costly, right? So instead of that, we actually plan things in a skill dynamic level, right? So at after each skill, so instead of the in the in case of this action dynamic model, what we do is after performing this is low level actions, what happens, right? And then after one other low level action, what happens, and so on. So, but instead of that, we actually predict. We actually imagine more of what happens when I execute this skill A and skill B and skill C. So the dynamic model is changing condition based on the um, skill better than action, low level actions. And then you can do the same. So you can move and slide and so on, which and also you can also plan accordingly based on this skill dynamics. Yeah, so based on that, we can do this. And so instead of this a single step dynamic model, we propose this a skill dynamic model um, which can make planning much more efficient and also for the downstream task too. All right. Um, so yeah, so I basically talked about how we can take a leverage of this task agnostic data and extract the skills and their skill prior or maybe merging with it, learning from demonstration with the skills or even doing meta learning with the skills. And lastly, I talked about changing this dynamic model from action model actions to skills as well. So that's one part of it. Um, for the interest of time, I will probably skip some other part of the talks, to, I think because of delay. So I will skip some of the predefined and external knowledge today and just jump into the last, last part of the talk. So um, yeah, so I basically went through in depth about this like, learning from offline data. Um, and so then now next question, one of the question I had was how we can actually do benchmark this, okay? So in, of course, you know, in computer vision, people talked about, you know, I mean, people had, a, we had an image net and based on the image net, we had a, made a lot of progress and there's NLP and with NLP data, we have GPT-3, et cetera, of course. And then so for robotics, what can we do? Now that there's RT1 just released yesterday. So I don't know whether I should talk about this, but we, we might as well do it, okay? So, um, so all year last year, I talked about, um, we released a data set, uh, which is simulated environments about IKEA furniture assembly, right? So what we did is that we just had, we built a simulated environment which actually has multiple agents with multiple furniture models um, that can do assembly, okay? And um, right, so in this environment, we try to make uh, as a realistic simulated environment, we can do, which simulates a furniture assembly process, for example, grasping, attaching, or, you know, dragging things around and so on. But the main question is how can we, what, what about the real world, right? So we are basically making, we are about to release the real world font assembly benchmark. Of course, the main goal is that um, rather than just a simple and short horizon task, we want to release it for the um, longer horizon font assembly process, but that can be tested in the, you know, in anywhere, in the same exact situation, the same exact environments too, right? So reproducibility is one of the key part we try to catch here. So using 3D, 3D printers, we have uh, parts and all, all everything try to mimic. So you can actually print that at, any, any, in your, at your home or in your lab with all this uh, uh, Panda Franca robots, okay? Which contains many dextrous skills like grasping, flipping, but also insertions um, and 
screwing um, with 100 plus hours of demonstrations we collected for you know, longer horizon task. So for example, from this initial state, our goal is to assemble this chair in this 3D model, um, and which obviously requires lots of uh, soft skills like picking up or screening or also moving things around or insertion, et cetera. So you can see with this 1,000 demonstration, we, applied, we collected 1,000 demonstration and applied a IQL on top of it. Um, they can at least learn to assemble like one leg in this case specifically. So you get the main idea here. Um, so we vary the initial pose as well too. We try to randomize it from this very fixed initial pose all the way to completely random. Um, of course, when things are fixed in the initial pose, they are they're pretty good. But um, when we actually go to this completely randomized initialization, due to the number of the demonstration we have, it's not enough to learn all this dynamics and everything. So usually it wouldn't work. Um, and of course we can also do, um, because of this is about skills, right? Um, we also try, we have benchmark for skills, individual skills as well. So when you train these policies out of demonstrations or reinforced learning, whatever you want to, we also can evaluate and everything as well. Um, and we also set up a simulation, simulate environments so it can actually um, do proxy experiments as well too, if you care to. Yes, yeah, so although I skipped a, maybe half of the talk today, but um, basically today I talked about how we can utilize skills for long horizon task, and also maybe also talk about how we can actually benchmark them. Um, so how to utilize predefined skill sets, or also how to utilize offline experience data set, or even external knowledge like large language model data too. So some of the papers will be presented in this uh, in this conference and workshop today and then the rest of this week. So drop by if you think if you find them interesting and want to know more details about them too. Okay, and I will end this talk with by thanking my students here, um, and that's it. We have time for one question. So, oh yeah, it's a good question. So um, let me show you a slide. So it's basically, um, we have a set of, uh, let me see. Yeah, I can repeat that, yeah. Here. So the question was, how do we get um, just generic skills? Is that right? So how do we extract them? So we just have a lot of test agnostic trajectories, basically demonstrations, and then, uh, we assume fixed lengths of skills, like in this case, H here. And then we basically extract all, uh, we sample all this uh, sub trajectories of skill lengths H and then learn to encode them and decode them in this case, like here. Um, and then, oh yeah, so in this case, yeah. So that's, um, yeah, I guess that's a part that I skipped basically today. So when we are talking about offline experience here so far, we don't have any semantic meaning here at all. And when, we, when I refer the predefined skill set, they are usually referring uh, semantic skills. And also when I talk about the external knowledge, which we didn't even talk about, which will be present in the workshop, is actually trying to label them with some semantics, even for the unlabeled data. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey everyone, let me introduce our next invited speaker, Professor Chelsea Ping. Chelsea Ping is an assistant professor in computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University. 
Her research interests are to develop robots and other agents that develop broadly intelligent behavior through learning and interaction. She has done a lot of amazing work in meta learning and deep learning, robotic manipulation skills, and many other topics. But let's welcome Chelsea for her invited talk on how to generalize your robot. Awesome. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about generalization. Uh, and the motivation is that uh, I think that if you look at what robots are capable of today, uh, they can do things that look fairly impressive on the surface. Uh, for example, this video on the left is showing a robot uh, using a spatula lifting an object into a bowl. Uh, this is actually a video from six years ago. Uh, and the video on the right is showing a very impressive uh, kind of maneuvers from this Boston Dynamics uh, humanoid robot. Uh, and the catch is that while these behaviors are very impressive, uh, the behavior on the right was manually tuned for that one environment, and the behavior on the left was trained using 15 minutes of data. And I think this kind of goes to show that we can accomplish fairly complex skills, but we can only do so in very narrow and controlled environments. Uh, and if, for example, you gave the robot a different spatula, or if you moved one of the blocks slightly for um, the right robot, the robot wouldn't be able to successfully complete what it was doing in these videos. And so what I'm really interested in is how we might allow robots to generalize to the real world uh, beyond the kind of very narrow lab environments that we typically watch uh, and evaluate robots in. Now, uh, I think that one of the big challenges here is that typically the training distribution is not as wide as the test distribution. Uh, we might be training in our lab environment and ultimately wanting to actually deploy these systems into the real world where there's all sorts of spatulas and all sorts of environments. Now, to try to get over this challenge and actually allow robots to generalize broadly, I think that there's uh, two different things that we can do. Uh, the first is just to try to train on a broader data set to try to expand the training distribution. And arguably, this is the one of the only recipes that's convincingly enabled in the wild generalization with uh, kind of uh, complex tasks like image recognition and natural language processing. And I think that this is going to be necessary to allow robots to generalize to the real world. But I also don't think it's going to be sufficient. And I think that we're also going to need to be able to generalize beyond the training distribution. Uh, and the second part is also, uh, uh, is, I guess, arguably a lot more challenging than the first part because we don't have necessarily examples of doing this um, successfully at scale in the real world. Uh, but I think that there's something in robotics that can allow us to do this. Uh, and in particular, we can't hope to anticipate every possible scenario that the robot might find itself in. Uh, but what we can do is the robot will actually be interacting with the environment at test time. And so, Perhaps the robot could actually continue to train at test time to allow it to adapt beyond the training distribution and ultimately um, generalize to some of the scenarios that we can't anticipate ahead of time. And so I think that both of these ingredients are really important uh, for getting generalization. And I'll be talking about both of them in this talk. Um, great, so let's first start by talking about uh, broadening the training distribution and seeing what robots can do and how well they can generalize. Now, um, there's a lot of prior works in this direction. I'll mention a, a couple kind of um, kind of realms of prior work. Um, we'll be focusing on imitation learning in this first part of the talk. Um, and so these prior works are in the imitation learning realm. Um, we've seen examples of imitating from a single video of a human. Uh, this can generalize to new objects and arguably to a form of a new task, where the goal is to, um, in this case, case, put a peach into the red bowl when it had never seen um, putting things into red bowls before. Uh, but it's trained and tested within a single skill. So it's trained and tested within the skill of placing objects. Um, the second class of approaches uh, has shown successful imitation learning from language instructions. And we've seen evidence of these generalizing to new uh, instructions and particularly new ways of phrasing um, tasks. Uh, but in general, with, these, uh, with many of these prior works, the new instructions are describing behavior that's seen in the data. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to try to go beyond these prior works um, and ultimately be able to do uh, tasks, do new tasks in the robots environment, uh, including with a system that was trained on lots of different skills. So specifically what I mean um, in this case by new tasks is uh, we want the robot to be able to, uh, in the scene, pick up the grapes and place it into a ceramic bowl. 
And in its training data set, it won't have seen any example behaviors of picking up the grapes and putting it into that bowl. It will have seen demonstrations of placing other objects, um, including into the ceramic bowl, and it will have seen demonstrations of doing other things with the grapes, but it won't have seen a trajectory that follows that behavior. Um, to make things actually even more difficult, we're actually going to also only collect data across two distinct object sets, and it actually won't have seen any data with the grapes in the ceramic bowl in the same seat. Great. Um, and then lastly, we'll be collecting a data set with 100 total tasks with nine underlying skills. And the data set looks something like this, uh, where the, um, the robot is collected, the data is collected with teleoperation um, and is collected for a, a variety of skills like um, placing a banana in a purple bowl, knocking over an eraser, um, and uh, stacking an eraser on top of a sponge, and so forth. Great. Um, so once we have this large demonstration data set with 100 different tasks, uh, we're going to train a policy to take as input the image and the instruction and output the corresponding robot motor command. So this is going to operate directly on RGB images, and it will be a policy that is operating at 10 hertz and outputting seven DOF position control. So um, the position orientation and the, uh, the kind of the, the joint angle of the gripper. And we chose this because we wanted a policy that would be maximally general. Uh, we want a policy that can do uh, all sorts of tasks with this given robot. Um, and then lastly, when we go about training this policy, uh, we're actually going to be using a fixed pre-trained language embedding for the instruction. And the rest of the policy will be trained end-to-end uh, -end on the collected demonstration data set. Now, getting back to the goal of generalization, uh, if the robot is going to generalize to new tasks, it needs to be able to do a number of different things. It needs to be able to correctly interpret the language command. It needs to be able to visually identify the relevant objects versus the distractor objects in the scene. And it also needs to be able to translate the instruction and what it's perceiving into the robot's action space. And it needs to be able to do all of these things, three things within this single policy um, that's trained end to end. And so generalization to these new tasks is actually quite challenging. Cool. Um, and so we can look at exactly the task that I showed before uh, of trying to pick up the grapes in the, and put it in the ceramic bowl. We give it the instruction, place grapes in ceramic bowl. And we see that the robot is able to successfully complete the task. Uh, and what's cool about this is that we can not only do that one task, but we can do a range of tasks that weren't seen in the training data set. And this includes uh, placing the banana on the white sponge, placing the bottle in the tray, and pushing the purple wool. Cool. Um, so those are the qualitative results in terms of videos. Um, quantitatively, we did an evaluation where we pre-selected 28 held out tasks, where we didn't know what the performance would be before the evaluation. And we evaluated performance of the language condition policy on all of those held out tasks. Uh, and what we see is that on 20 out of 28 of the held out tasks, there is non-zero success rate. Uh, and the average success rate is a 32% over all of the tasks. And so this means that there's really substantial signs of being able to zero shot generalize to these challenging tasks. Uh, but there's also considerable room for improvement. Uh, and we can actually look at the um, kind of the breakdown and actually kind of break down where that room for improvement is lying. And if we evaluate the performance of the policy um, of held out, uh, held out tasks with language commands, we get the 32% of this previous table. Uh, but we can also evaluate performance on the training tasks with language commands and with one hot task IDs. And what this tells us is it tells us that there's an 8% gap between the training tasks and the held out tasks. Uh, when you could condition on language, this gap is actually pretty small. And um, there's a 2% gap between language and one hot. And then there's a 58% gap between just solving the training tasks uh, and, and optimal performance, which would be at 100% success. Uh, and this means that just actually solving the training tasks, actually being able to do well at fine grain visual motor control is a big challenge. Uh, and we can actually look at the, um, the kind of the failure cases qualitatively. And if we look at the, the task of placing the banana in the ceramic cup, uh, we see that the robot actually goes and picks up the cup, moves the, the banana and moves towards the cup, but isn't able to complete the last part of the task. Uh, and as a result, it gets a success rate of 0%. 
Um, and similarly, if we give it the task of wiping a tray with a sponge, um, it can pick up the sponge and get, uh, get to the tray, um, but doesn't quite complete the wiping motion at the end. Um, so clearly fine grain control is, is a bottleneck. And um, this kind of brings me to the question of uh, what if we just collect more data and kind of scale up the data and the model? Uh, and this is um, this kind of scaling up effort is uh, is a paper that came out yesterday, so I haven't had a ton of time to put together slides for it. Um, but we scaled up the data set. We uh, collected, uh, in this case, 130,000 demonstrations uh, collected over several months uh, for 700 more than 700 different tasks, uh, which is up from the 100 tasks that was in the BCZ paper. And if we just take the BCZ architecture and scale up the model when we try to train it on this data set, the performance actually doesn't get better when you make the model larger. Uh, and this suggests that the, the model is underfitting and the architecture isn't able to kind of absorb all of the rich information that's in this really broad data set. And so um, this motivated us to construct an architecture uh, that can try to actually absorb all of that data and actually be able to do all of those different diverse tasks. And so uh, we're gonna be using a transformer-based architecture because transformers are known for being able to uh, have high capacity and absorb lots of data. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll have uh, uh, an image encoder that's uh, using kind of film to condition on the instructions. Uh, then we'll tokenize the, um, the, the encoding of the images, pass that into a transformer, and then we'll also be uh, tokenizing the actions uh, and having that be the output of the policy. Um, we're using a decoder only transformer. Um, and so the, uh, the objective on predicting the actions is a sparse categorical entropy um, objective. And uh, the image tokenizer, um, as I mentioned before, we're using this kind of film efficient net architecture. And this means that um, we're not actually tokenizing the patches in the image, we're tokenizing uh, the kind of output of, um, of this film encoder. Uh, and then lastly, just for faster inference, because we want to be able to run this policy on the robot in real time um, and, and just uh, make the, the model smaller, um, we use this token learner to decrease the number of tokens um, and ultimately get efficiency gains. Um, great. And then as I mentioned, we're scaling up the data set. And so um, the data set is 130,000 episodes. It was collected over 17 months on 13 different robots uh, and covers 700 tasks. Cool. Um, so here were the results that I showed before uh, with the BCZ architecture on scene tasks, and then also unseen tasks, unseen distractors, and unseen backgrounds. And um, when evaluating this uh, kind of transformer-based architecture in blue, uh, we see that first, uh, the performance on the scene tasks is actually much, much higher. It gets to around a 98% success rate on the training tasks. Uh, and this means that it's able to absorb the data and actually be able to perform the training tasks much better than these previous models, including the Gatto model. Uh, and then we also see that these gains in training translate into gains in generalization. Uh, and so we're able to generalize um, much more effectively, more than 20% more effectively to unseen tasks, distractors, and backgrounds. Um, great. And then the, the last thing that I'll mention on this point is actually, um, I think that's kind of the, the most interesting kind of comparison uh, that we did in this paper was uh, to actually look at how does the data set affect performance and generalization? Um, we looked at as you increase the amount of data and also as you increase the diversity of the data. Uh, and we see that um, as we kind of decrease the diversity of the data, the performance decreases significantly. Whereas if we keep the diversity, but just decrease the size of the data set, um, the performance drops off much more shallow, in a much more shallow way. And so this suggests that really diversity in the data that we're training robots on is really critical for enabling broad generalization. Great. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention in terms of diversity is thinking about kind of looking forward how might we train on an even more diverse data set? So um, the data set that I mentioned, it was very large and, and covered 700 different tasks, which is quite diverse, but it was still all collected in a couple buildings. And it was still only on a single robot platform. Uh, and so I think that there's, um, 
there's a kind of a challenge in terms of actually collecting data that's diverse enough to enable the kind of generalization that we want to see across lots of environments and so forth. Uh, and I think that the really the, the challenge and the reason why that's challenging is that um, typically in robot learning, we collect data set, we collect a data set for a project, and then we don't use that data ever again. Uh, and then we kind of repeat this process uh, for each and every project. Uh, and in contrast, the machine learning research community typically will collect a large data set once, uh, like ImageNet, and then reuse it many, many times, um, or even better, reuse a pre-trained model that was pre-trained on that data set. Uh, and so what I think is really important to actually start to move towards as a robot learning community is to start to move towards the right, um, towards the, what the machine learning research community is doing. Uh, and to do that, we need to not only collect the data set once and reuse it, but ultimately try to collect data once and share it across multiple different institutions. Uh, and so if we're able to do this, I think we'd be able to make much more progress collectively as a robotics community than if we kind of continued along this path of kind of collecting data at one institution and using that data. Um, now, there's this question of, okay, there's a reason why we're not sharing data across universities and institutions. Um, and what is that reason? Well, I think that uh, kind of, there's an analogy that we can make. This came out of a, a kind of a workshop that, at Berkeley where we discussed some of these things, where I think that we have these different data sets and they're all kind of islands in this really massive ocean of, um, of kind of the possible scenes and, and, and so forth that robots can see. And so each of these islands corresponds to a different data set. Um, some of them are larger islands than others and so forth. But when you go and do your next project where you want to get a robot to do something, inevitably uh, these islands don't cover the full space of, the, um, of what the robot will be seeing. And so your next experiment will still be far enough away from these data sets such that these prior data sets aren't useful. Uh, and likewise for your experiment after that. Uh, and so this is something that's still kind of very kind of uh, in early stages and something that we're just getting started right now. Um, but we think that in order to actually start to share data across institutions, we need data from many distinct environments um, to basically a much broader data set. Um, and really also as kind of a centralized community driven data collection effort so that we can standardize along some dimensions um, and uh, kind of stay close to at least one um, island so that we can yeah start to actually have an island that fully covers like parts of the distribution that we want to be um, doing experiments in. And so our goal is to collect data in lots of different real household environments. Um, 50 is a minimum. Um, we'd love to collect it in, in hundreds of household environments. Um, so far, we have a Slack channel with uh, 24 people from 12 different Slack organizations, uh, mostly across the, the US. Uh, and if you're interested in contributing or playing a role in this effort, uh, feel free to let Sasha know or to let me know. Cool. Um, so the takeaway of this first part, um, and really the bulk of the talk, is that uh, language conditioned imitation learning with a really diverse data set can allow robots to generalize uh, zero shot to new tasks to new environments uh, and so forth. Uh, and I think that this is really exciting, uh, but I also think that we should, to kind of move forward, we should actually start to share data across institutions to generalize even further. Um, great, and then in the last part of the talk, uh, I like to touch a little bit on not just broadening the data set, but also trying to go beyond the training data set. Um, and the um to kind of set the stage here i'll mention some work that is was at coral a couple years ago where we wanted to allow a robot that was trained to do grasping to generalize to scenarios that were far out of distribution and so what we did is we actually had this grasping system and we actually tried to seek out scenarios in which the grasping system was doing poorly and we found that um, scenarios like harsh lighting conditions transparent objects that it hadn't seen before uh, a checkerboard background as well as a, kind of a physical change to the robot, we're all dropping the performance significantly. So the original success rate of the robot was around 86%. Uh, and then on these new test environments, the success rate dropped substantially to 30 to 50%. Um, and like I mentioned before, it's really kind of impossible to anticipate the kinds of scenarios that the robot might find itself in, like these kinds of scenarios. And so instead of trying to train a policy that's going to be robust to every possible scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to try to adapt at test time 
to these new environments. And so specifically in this work, we did something very simple, which was just to collect some grasps in the new environment and then fine tune our grasping policy on a mix of the new data and some of the old data. And we found that with as few as 25 grasps in the new environment, we were already able to substantially increase the success rate, um, in some cases up to a performance that was close or even higher than the base policy. Um, great, so that's kind of a case study in grasping that, that fine tuning really allows robots to adapt uh, to these new environments. But what about in general beyond grasping? Um, one thing that's kind of special about grasping is that if you want to kind of attempt the task multiple times, you can just drop the object and then try to uh, pick it up again. But with reinforcement learning in general, uh, if you're collecting multiple different episodes, it can actually be rather challenging to get from kind of the final state of an episode to the kind of starting state to reattempt the task. And in simulation, we can just call kind of env.reset to, to do this. Uh, but in the real world, we, we can't necessarily do that. And um, the, um, a lot of works that have applied reinforcement learning to the real world have actually tried to have a, man, like a human manually come in and reset the scene. And if we want to be able to adapt at test time during deployment, that sort of manual intervention isn't going to be scalable. Now you might ask, well, can we just run existing reinforcement learning algorithms without resets and just don't reset the environment and continue to have them to run? And uh, it turns out that that actually works quite poorly. So if you take this really simple fish environment um, from I think the DM control sweep, if you get a, give it a reset every thousand time steps, uh, it does fairly well. Um, it's able to learn a policy that solves the task. Uh, if you decrease the number of uh, resets to every 2000 steps, the performance drops. Uh, and as you kind of decrease the frequency in which it's getting resets, the quality of the policy that it learns degrades substantially over time to the point that it's not actually able to learn a policy that solves the task. Um, and note that the y-axis here is measuring the kind of evaluation of the policy, not the return achieved during training. So um, this result was actually initially somewhat surprising to me. Uh, it's, it's interesting that when you kind of remove these resets, these reinforcement learning algorithms degrade substantially. Uh, and so this has motivated us to introduce a problem setting that we're referring to as single life reinforcement learning. Um, and in contrast to episodic reinforcement learning or reset free reinforcement learning, we're specifically considering a scenario where you have some previous experience of, so of actually possibly solving the task. And then you're placed in a kind of a novel scenario. Maybe it's a novel environment. Maybe something about the task has changed slightly. And your goal is to be able to perform the task in that new out of distribution scenario within a single episode without any human interventions. Um, and so actually at test time, you might be running reinforcement learning in order to adapt to that form of novelty and ultimately be able to handle the out of distribution scenario. Cool. Um, so kind of put succinctly, given previous data in the training environment, the agent has one life to autonomously complete the task in a novel scenario. Um, and so one example of this is we could have uh, this really simple half cheetah agent. Uh, maybe it was trained to kind of run forward in an environment without obstacles. At test time, it gets this new obstacle, which is pretty far outside of anything that it's seen during training. And its goal is to try to figure out how to handle that new scenario at test time within one episode. Cool. Um, so let's actually look at this problem and, and, and see what we can do. So let's say that we train this top cheetah on a flat environment without obstacles, and then we deploy it at test time. And it's, this is a video of the single episode that is given at test time. And this is just running a standard RL algorithm to fine tune the policy. And uh, I think it's running uh, kind of the soft factor critic algorithm here. And what you'll notice is that uh, when it is actually trying to solve this task and trying to kind of move forward to get towards the goal, um, it encounters this out of distribution state of being of kind of having fallen over. And it really struggles to kind of get back up and figure out how to actually ultimately get towards the goal. Uh, and in general, this is a challenge with, um, with existing reinforcement learning methods in that they're not necessarily going to explicitly encourage the agent to recover from these out of distribution states. 
And really what we'd like to be able to see is a robot that can figure out how to get up and ultimately kind of move on its way and, and get to the goal. So to try to encourage the agent to recover, um, one potential option might be to reward, to, to kind of shape the reward function towards the distribution of prior data. And if we do this, it might help the agent recover because it might help it get towards states that it knows what to do in. Um, that said, there's um, existing distribution matching approaches um, will assume that you have expert demonstrations as prior data, and they might aim to match the entire distribution of the prior data. And so we're going to we're going to use these kinds of approaches, but we're going to tweak them a little bit. Uh, and the key idea is to kind of weight the states in your prior data by their estimated Q value. So we'll estimate a Q value with offline RL from your prior data. Um, this will estimate the desirability of the state. And then we're going to train a state discriminator weighted by the exponentiated Q value. And this will encourage the policy to stay towards states that, are, that have high Q value from the prior data. And so this is going to basically encourage it to not get stuck. And when it, if it does get stuck, uh, to kind of try to find a way back towards the kinds of states that it saw in the previous data that had high Q value. Cool. Um, and otherwise, it will be the same. So we're going to be running reinforcement learning at test time. We're just going to be modifying the objective to have this additional term to encourage it to go back to high value states. Cool. Um, and then if we run this in the same exact environment that I showed before, uh, we see that the agent, um, it, this is a no novel scenario. So it's something, it does actually have to figure out how to, it doesn't get to the goal immediately, um, but it does actually fall over at some point. And it's able to kind of get back up and figure out how to, to um, handle the new situation by running the training at test time and guiding it towards high value states. Um, so yeah, it helped the quail is able to help the agent recover when it falls into these out of distribution states. Um, and we looked at a number of experimental domains and, and kind of uh, if we compare quail to just running reinforcement learning um, in these environments, we see that the success rate um, is higher uh, in these environments. Um, actually significantly higher, and it also is able to get to the goal with fewer steps. Uh, and it's also able to do um, kind of better than an approach that uses exploration bonuses at test time in order to try to get out of those states. Um, so this sort of approach is able to significantly outperform fine tuning. Um, that said, there's also plenty of room for improvement. And I think that this sort of uh, kind of test time adaptation setting is a really interesting problem, and I hope that more people look at this um, this sort of test time adaptation within a single episode in future work. Um, great. So to summarize the talk, um, I talked about first training on broader data sets, and second, generalizing beyond the training distribution. Um, and in the first case, we saw a significant zero shot generalization by training on more diverse data. And in the second case, we saw that robots uh, in, in simple simulated settings are able to adapt to out of distribution scenarios by actually adapting autonomously at test time. Um, I'd like to thank my students and also acknowledge um, a number of uh, a large number of researchers at Google who um, who put together the the RT1 work. And uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah, so the question was, um, are there, uh, given kind of the successes in like other areas like NLP and computer vision, um, is there any problem that data can't solve? Um, so I guess, I think that, I guess a few things. Um, first, I think that there is a challenge in terms of figuring out how to collect useful data. And I think that we do actually in robotics need efforts, like we've done a lot of work in collecting demonstrations and, and, and we're also like collecting more demonstrations as well. But I think that ultimately to get the kind of data that we want and the scale that we want, we'll probably want more than just demonstrations. We'll want robots to collect data autonomously. And I think that there's an open question of what sorts of algorithms and what sorts of techniques should be used to have robots collect data on their own. Um, and then the second thing is, I, I think that there is a lot of research 
to be done on going beyond the, the training data distribution uh, and the like um, the kind of the single life stuff that I talked about is um, is super uh, is kind of one example of that. Um, and in some ways, it's just using data at test time as well. But there's challenges of autonomy. There's still um, room for improvement, like I mentioned there. Uh, and I think that like there are other ways that you could try to generalize beyond the, the train distribution as well. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is I think that the, um, well, I think that there are other challenges as well that aren't solved by data um, alone necessarily. Uh, like safety, for example, it might be challenging to collect lots of data of catastrophic failures. Um, and another example is like, if you're looking at really long horizon tasks, it may be that um, that sort of combinatorial structure, uh, we need other techniques to allow us to tackle that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I should clarify that if you evaluate on held out tasks with one hot conditioning, that would get zero percent here, uh, because you'll you'll be giving it a new one hot, uh, and it can't interpret a new one hot vector. Uh, and so there, it, it is actually really getting a lot of benefits from generalizing from language. That's how we're get going from zero to thirty two percent. The what we're seeing is on the training tasks, there's a small gap, and that means that it's actually able to interpret the language quite well, and it's able to distinguish between different instructions for different tasks. Okay, yeah, yeah, we have lunch, um, and then the choral welcome ceremony. Uh, so please be back here at 2.30. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we'll get started again with another round of uh, invited spotlight talks. Uh, and uh, this will be a virtual session. So let's get started as maybe everyone slowly starts trickling in. Uh, the first talk will be by Arjun. Uh, Arjun, if you're uh, available, you can start by unmuting yourself. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Arjun, and I'll be presenting Zson Zero Shot Object Goal Navigation using Multimodal Goal Embeddings. Uh, this is joint work with Gunjan, Bhavika, Judy, and Dhruv. In this work, we consider the object goal navigation task, where we place an agent in a new, previously unseen 3D environment and give it an instruction like, go to the toilet. And what you can imagine is that this agent is going to need to explore this new environment to find a bathroom and hopefully find the toilet. In this work, we consider an open world setting in which not only are we going to place the agents in new environments, but we'd also like them to be able to find any object that can be described in natural, natural language. Typically, we train object nav agents using either 3D environments, which we can then use for reinforcement learning, or by collecting large-scale human demonstrations and then training with behavior cloning. And we're going to refer to these as fully supervised methods. And the challenge here is that collecting this kind of annotated uh, training data is costly, and it's going to be difficult to scale, especially in this open world setting that we're considering here. So what we're going to be looking for is an object nav method 
that doesn't require any of this type of human annotated training data um, for training. And we're gonna to refer to this as a zero shot method. And so to summarize, what we're looking for is an open world method that's also zero shot falling in the top right of this diagram you see here. Now, the key idea is going to be that we're going to disentangle how we represent semantic goals from how we learn visual navigation. So to represent semantic goals, we're gonna use a clip text encoder to encode goals like find a sofa into a visuolinguistic embedding space. And what this is gonna allow us to do is train or learn navigation using image goals, which we're going to encode with the clip visual encoder. And because of the way that clip was trained, if we have this image goal, such as the one on the slide that has a sofa in it, the embedding of this image goal is gonna be close to our instruction, the embedding of our instruction, find a sofa. And so what this is gonna allow us to do is train our agents with image goal navigation uh, for image goal navigation and then zero shot transfer to object map. And so what's the point here? Well, it turns out that image training for image goal navigation doesn't require any of that labeled training data that I described earlier. In fact, we can procedurally generate image goal navigation training episodes. So what we do is we sample a 3D point in one of these environments. We snap a picture from that uh, location and that's our image goal. And then we train agents to find these locations and that can all be done procedurally. But then because we're using these clip encoders to embed these goals into a common embedding space, we can then zero shot transfer to language goals at test time um, for object nav. In a little bit more detail, uh, we train the semantic navigation agent that you see here that takes in RGB observations, encodes them with a visual encoder. This encoding is then concatenated with our semantic goal embeddings and then fed to a recurrent policy network that outputs a distribution over actions. And at test time, we're simply going to swap out those image goal representations for our language goal representations using the clip text encoder. Now this full approach is shown here um, and it turns out that this works better than prior work in zero shot object goal navigation on two different data sets. But what I like about this is that now we have a natural language interface to our agents. And so instead of following an instruction like find a sink, we can modify the instruction to be find a bathroom sink, as you see in the top left. And now our agent is gonna find a sink in the bathroom. But if instead we say find the kitchen sink, as you see in the top right, uh, the agent is no longer going to go anywhere close to the, or go into a bathroom. And it's always going to end up in the kitchen. Here's a visualization of our agent navigating. You can see that our agents always start with this 360 degree turn. It's because we've placed them in a new environment and they need to get some context of where they are. In this case, the agent's looking for a bathroom sink. So it's gonna enter this hallway, uh, turn to the left, and then eventually stop uh, in this bathroom. So thank you, please see our paper for more details. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, the next presentation will be on visual reinforcement learning with self-supervised 3D representations. And the speaker can unmute and proceed. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm very delighted to introduce our work accepted by Coral 2020 workshop on pre-training robot learning, which is visual reinforcement learning with self supervised 3D representations. This is work jointly finished by me, Gareth Hansen, Yimbo Chen, Mohi Chen, and Xiaolong Wang in UC San Diego. First, I will give the working pipeline of our method. Our goal is is to learn a 3D representation that could represent the object geometry, the scene geometry, and the scene structure, so that our learned 3D representation could transfer to diverse area tasks. Therefore, we first pre-train a 3D visual representation on the large-scale object-centric object data set called CO3D using, using this task. And then, we fine tune the pre trained representation and train the policy on the downstream IO tasks in the simulation environments. Finally, not only test in the simulation environments, 
to set up role environments in the real world and do a zero shadow transfer. One specific design of us is to provide two cameras in a simulation environment. One is static and another is dynamic. The dynamic camera also moves in an object-centric manner. Now, let us go into the training progress. For the R part, we only utilize the pre trained 2D encoder. We encode the image from the static camera to get the 2D feature map and use the 2D feature map to predict the action with a MLP policy. Parallel to the R objective, we use a 3D auxiliary task to fine tune the presentation. Still, we get the 2D feature map from the static view. After this, we, re we reshape the 2D feature map and use the 3D convolution to get the deep work saw. Here, we also use the image from the dynamic view to predict the relative transformation between these two views. Then, we transform the work saw with the predicted rotation and translation. And Rick's draw the dynamic view with the transformative work saw. Combining the R objective and 3D object together, we have the entire pipeline with way of training our agent in simulation environments. We then test the simple real transferability of our 3D representation. We also compare with other pre trained methods like MOCO. In push task, the robot needs to push the green object to the red target. This task is much harder than reach since it requires the understanding of the interaction between objects, and our method could succeed much more times than baseline. Same as in push, the pack inbox task also requires spatial understanding. The last task is lift, which requires the robot to grasp the object due to the gap between the real world and the simulation, like friction, object material, and so on. Zero short transform is harder than just doing it in simulation. Our main setup will still grasp things. To further show the robustness of our 3D method, we change the real robot setup to a more different one. If for the comparison between the changes and non changes here, we could find that our method could still achieve the same success rate, while for MoCo, it's very hard to transform. Here is push. And here is pegging box. And here's lift. Thanks. Thank you. The, the next presentation will be on exploring visual pre-training for robot manipulation. If the speaker is around, uh, please connect. Uh, and present. Otherwise, I will play the pre recorded video. Hello, everyone. Here I will introduce our work, Exploring Visual Pro Training for Robot Manipulation, Data Sets, Models, and Methods. As we can see, Visual Pro Training for Robot Manipulation differs in pre training data, model architectures, and training methods. After pre training, the learned reuse of visual representations can be used for robot manipulation tasks in different environments. Although great progress has been made, the recipes of visual pre training for robot manipulation tasks are yet to be built. Therefore, we thoroughly investigate the effects of visual pre training strategies on robot manipulation tasks from three fundamental perspectives. 
for training data sets, model architectures, and training methods. Through explorations of various per-training data sets, model architectures, and per-training methods, three key conclusions could be drawn. First, interaction-related data set is more powerful. Secondly, ResNet performs better than Vision Transformer. Thirdly, contrastive learning is a preferred learning method. Based on the explorations, we propose our visual per-training scheme for robotic manipulation. Specifically, we first employ contrastive learning to apply human object interaction patterns self supervised. Then, to additional learning objectives, visual semantic predicting and temporal dynamics predicting are proposed to future in research encoder. It can be seen that our model achieves the best performance in both simulation environments. In addition, Ablation studies demonstrate the importance of each components to help robot manipulations. Furthermore, the success rate of a proposed WePROM improves stability as the size of demonstration data increases. We show the visualization results on front kitchen environment. It can be seen that our model has a higher success rate and a higher degree of action completion than R3M model on all five tasks. For the meta world simulator, since our visual representations learn good semantics and dynamics, they can be better used for action predictions. Therefore, our model takes fewer steps to complete the manipulation things. We also deploy here our model on a real robot. As we can see, the robot is competent for various manipulation tasks in the real kitchen environment. Over one, robot manipulation refers human object interaction data set. Convolution-based network, as well as temporal and thematic information. Therefore, we propose a normal pipeline, which pertains ResNet 50, where contrastive learning, visual semantics learning, and temporal dynamics learning. In future research work, we think training visual encoders is directly on videos has the potential to learn better temporal dynamics. Besides, we also need to establish a real data benchmark to facilitate this research. Thanks for your listening. The next set of presentations will be by uh, Andy Zhao. So please go ahead, Andy. Hello, I um, hope you can hear me. My name is Mandy, and today is my pleasure to join you virtually at the workshop. And I'm excited to tell you about Cacti, a framework for Scalable Multitask Multi-Scene Visual Imitation Learning. This is joined with um, Homanga, Vincent, Shuran, Arvind, and Wakash. As motivation, we aim to develop robots that are capable of a large number of skills, which could uh, lead to generalization in unknown scenarios. To take a learning-based approach, we would definitely need to collect a large number of data and train a single agent to efficiently learn from all the collected data. But as we think about building such systems, there are several key considerations we must keep in mind. First is the safety and operation cost that's unique to your robot systems. Collecting robot data is much more expensive than say, vision and language domains. Second is the difficulty of fully end-to-end -end methods. For example, multitask reinforcement learning training from scratch, which is known to be hard and uh, to balance. 
third would be the representation learning challenge from high dimensional visual observations. This is often data intensive and limits generalization. So in this work, we propose a framework to address these considerations from this perspective of multitask, multi-scene, visual imitation. The framework is composed of four key stages, collect, argument, compress, and train. Hence, we have the convenient acronym CACTI. I would also want to highlight there's two aspects that are particularly relevant to this workshop. First is sort of a recurring theme today, um, how the framework is set up to do a large scale imitation learning as a pre-training procedure. This will lead to generalization to unknown scenarios or possibly even new tasks. Second is how we take advantage of pre-trained models from other domains, namely the self-supervised representation learning trained on human activity video data, equal 4D, and also stable diffusion, which is also a state-of-the-art text-to-image generation model, similar to how um, Dali authors used before. Back to the framework, in the first stage, we collect expert demonstrations for many tasks and scene layouts. Because we have uh, real-world hardware, we assume access to human experts that can collect data via kinesthetic teaching. Next, we take the limited amount of expensive expert data and boost its diversity via augmentation. The key idea here is to replay a sequence of recorded expert actions and inject visual variations later. In the real robot setup, we randomize the distractor locations during the replay. And in addition, we use the stable diffusion model and the in-painting functionality to generate even more data with realistically looking distractors. Here are some examples and the text prompt that we used. Next stage is compress, where we compress the visual observations with the pre-trained visual backbones mentioned before. This approach of re using pre-trained representations has recently been validated again and again in robot imitation learning and is particularly suitable in our case as we scale up the number of tasks and variations in the data set. Lastly is, of course, the training stage where we use all of the data and augmented data to train a single multitask policy. Thanks to the augmentation and the compression stage, the policy takes much less resources to train. And we know it's better set up for generalization to unknown visual variances. Uh, I'll focus on talking about the real robot result. We instantiate the framework with 10 tasks involving six main objects and additional distractor objects that are randomly layout for visual complexity. We use the uh, in-painting augmentation. Some more examples are here. Here is also a sketch of our multitask policy architecture. Note that we use this uh, language uh, token embeddings as the task conditioning in the multitask policy. We report the results on training a single policy on 10 training tasks. A few things to note. First is that the policy trained on top of a frozen visual backbone can yield competitive performance around 30% success rate across all 10 tasks. This is desirable because of the training efficiency. And we have to train essentially a few NLP layers on our policy model. Also note that the in-painting augmentation greatly improves performance, which enables this frozen out of domain backbone to perform even better than the fine tuning on the backbone on the original no augmentation data set. Here are some videos of the final train policy doing the 10 training tasks is conditioned on the language co uh, command. And during test time, the distractor objects are randomly shuffled. You can see that the uh, green cubes here and the toy banana are all uh, completely unseen in the training set, but the policy is able to ignore it and complete the task. Here are some more examples how it, of how the policy is robust to seeing variations. It can successfully drag the mug even when the distractor layout is unseen from training data. Um, thank you so much for watching and please see our submission for more details. I believe the next presentation is also by Mandy, so feel free to go ahead. Uh, okay, I thought there was one before me. One second.
Um, all right, here is me again. Here I'm talking about another work uh, on effectiveness of fine tuning versus meta reinforcement learning for robotic manipulation. This is joint work with Peter and Steven. And I will start by motivation again, where like human, we want a robot that can learn a task, new task efficiently. This calls for the need of meta learning, what we call a learn to learn. A popular sub-branch of meta-learning is meta-reinforcement learning, where agents are meta-trained on multiple tasks and adapt to a new task, both via RL. However, when we look at the previous work in meta-RL, there has been a variety of novel algorithms, but the task setup is still quite easy. Using simple environments and low-dimensional state action spaces, training and testing are often done on different variations of the same task such as different running directions of an end agent. These variations tend to belong to a narrow distribution where evaluation is done on these interpolated or extrapolated variations. So in this work, we try to push for a more challenging setting to test if meta-RL can actually adapt to novel tasks, especially in robot manipulation. We argue that this kind, this kind of adaptation is more realistic and desirable, especially for robotics, and is closer to how humans would actually adapt. We also consider this important baseline that meta-RL literature sometimes omits, which is multitask pre-training followed by fine-tuning when you're adapting. Recent work in supervised and self-supervised learning, such as two-shot image classification, have shown this baseline is a simple but quite effective solution over more complicated meta-learning algorithms. So this calls into question if similar conclusion can be made in reinforcement learning. So we conduct a large-scale study primary benchmark to investigate is RL Bench, a vision-based table manipulation benchmark. For completeness and generalization of the conclusion, we also studied two more um, popular vision-based RL benchmarks, Progen and Atari. All three benchmarks are multitask in nature, but rarely used to evaluate meta-RL. We compare representative meta-RL algorithms, both gradient-based and context-based, reptile, RL square, Perl, and a simple fine-tuning baseline. The TLDR version of our conclusion is that multitask pre-training with fine-tuning is surprisingly strong. It performs equally as well or better than meta pre-training with meta test time adaptation. In our bench, we train on 10 different robot manipulation tasks and we test on five held out tasks separately. We show that fine-tuning does well on completely unseen tasks. And for example, this taking lid off the saucepan task, it can significantly perform training, outperform training from scratch and reduces the need for initial demonstrations in the sparse reward setting. This trend is consistent across all the test time tasks, but sort of varies in performance based on the task difficulty. I'll quickly go over the uh, coin run and other Atari experiments. But for coin run, we compare training with different numbers of levels and testing on uh, a fixed set of test sets. You can see that as the training set gets bigger, both the zero shot and fine tuning performance gets improved on a test set. In Atari, we also train and test on different disjoint sets of Atari games. While the relative performance between fine tuning and meta adaptation is consistent with previous benchmarks, we found that they don't really significantly outperform training from scratch on the test games. This suggests that there's limited transferability across the Atari games. In conclusion, we present the first large-scale multitask and meta-RL study on three existing benchmarks. We showed that multitask pre-training followed by fine-tuning on novel tasks performs equally as well or better than common meta-RL baselines. We hence advocate for future research to shift towards more challenging benchmarks and include multitask pre-training with fine-tuning as a simple yet strong baseline. Um, all right, please see our paper for details and thank you for watching. Thank you, Mandy. We'll move on to the next talk.
I'm Negin, and today I'm presenting our paper on visual motor control in multi-object scenes using object-aware representations. The motivation for our work is that general purpose robots need to encode information about their environment and themselves in a way that is not task specific and can be easily transferred to new situations and tasks, such as the example robots shown on the left here. The presentation learning has been shown to be a powerful technique for this, but many of the current methods are supervised and they learn task specific representations that do not necessarily transfer well to other tasks. This makes them not scalable because collecting and labeling a new data set per task is expensive. So one solution for this can be using self-supervised learning methods that aim to learn representations from unlabeled data. Another motivation for our work was observing early on in our experiments that better perception inputs lead to more sample efficient policies, specifically in the task on the right here, where a robot is being trained to move one of the eight blocks to the pole using implicit behavior cloning or IBC. We found that if we give the policy access to ground truth segmentation masks on top of the RGB, it would be able to reach high performance with very few samples. But note that ground truth segmentation masks do not exist in real world scenarios, so we can't get this boost. But motivated by that observation, in this work, we found a method that increases performance of IBC compared to using plain RGB by using a self supervised approach that learns to get the segmentation masks without needing human annotation labels. And for this, we explored usage of a class of self supervised models called the slot attention that use a sequential attention based mechanisms to decompose low level features into abstract groups. Our hypothesis is that the abstracted information using slot attention can improve data sample efficiency and performance in downstream robotic tasks. We tested this hypothesis by first training a slot attention architecture in a self supervised manner, then freezing those weights and using the representations for two downstream tasks of object localization and multi object goal condition policy learning. I will skip explaining how we did the slot attention pre-training and refer you to the paper for more details, and I will discuss the results of the downstream tasks. As baselines, we were interested in exploring two ideas. One was to compare two methods that use contrastive loss, and for that we chose MoCo. And also, we were wanted to answer how important is the object centricness in our method, so we compared with an autoencoder baseline. For our first task of object localization, given an input image, we wanted to decode the location of the blocks and the end effector in the robot base coordinates. And we used probability of correct key points as an interpretable metric for us. And the way this uh, metric works is that if you uh, predict the, the location within a certain uh, threshold of the ground truth location, that is considered a correct prediction. Otherwise, we say that prediction is wrong. We observed that the baselines are struggled with localizing multiple objects. So MoCo and Autoencoder were able to learn to predict object location accuracy on a data set with a single object, as you can see on the left bar here. But they quickly start to struggle when there were four or eight blocks in the scene. And you can see a qualitative example of the MoCo's performance on the right. We observed that the slot attention was able to perform very well for the one and four block cases, but it starts to struggle to localize objects of the same color, but with fine grain differences in the eight block case scenario. However, overall, it can be seen that the slot significantly outperforms all the baselines in all the cases. Our second downstream task was multi-object goal condition policy learning. Here, given an input image and a one hot task embedding of the block we would like to move, we are training a policy using IBC to move that block to the pole. Here, you can see a demonstration of moving the red pentagon to the pole. We compared the performance of the policy training using different inputs such as RGB, RGB with ground truth segmentation masks, slot features, and autoencoder features. We observed that slot attention models provide a boost in performance in the success rate of task completion over using raw RGB as input. This is because these methods are object aware, and by using this prior, they're able to learn representations that result in a performance boost without needing any segmentation mask or any extra annotations from humans. We also found that a slot attention has better performance than autoencoder that suggested that the object and slot prior are important in this performance gain. The performance gain exists in all data regimes, but it increases as the data decreases. As evidence for real-world applications, we show a qualitative example of the slot attention algorithm successfully localizing objects and decomposing the scene um, trained with no labels in a real-world uh, robotic scenario. Thank you for listening. Please refer to our paper for more details.
Hi everyone, today I'll be presenting our ongoing work titled Transformer Adapters for Robot Learning with my co-authors Ishka Singh, Carl Persh, and my advisor Jesse Thompson. In order to understand the motivation for this work, we will take some inspiration from recent trends in the natural language processing community. In the past year, we've seen a flurry of larger and more powerful language models trained on vast internet text and demonstrate impressive capabilities on a range of downstream NLP tasks. However, as these models scale in size, it is impractical and inefficient to fine tune the entire model for each new downstream task. Instead of fine tuning all the parameters of these large language models, NLP researchers have proposed training small neuromodules called adapters, which are additional trainable parameters that are embedded between transformer layers. They are very lightweight compared to the full model, and because they share weights with the pre-trained model, they can leverage the linguistic priors to accelerate downstream learning. How can we translate some of the success stories of language models to robot learning? More specifically, can we adopt a similar framework as large language model training, where we first pre-train a transformer policy on offline data, and then use it as a shared backbone for learning new downstream tasks? In this work, we present a simple two-stage framework for modular multitask robot learning. We first pre-train a transformer policy on task agnostic robot data using behavior cloning. The pre-trained backbone should learn to capture behavior priors that help accelerate downstream learning, such as how to pick up an object or how to pull on handles. During downstream training, the goal is to learn how to perform new tasks in a few shot manner. We provide a handful of expert demonstrations for each target task. A new set of adapter weights are trained for each target task while the pre-trained model is kept frozen. Each adapter will affect specialized to a particular task. Since the adapter weights are shared with the backbone model, it can leverage the behavioral priors from pre-training to more efficiently learn the new task. We employ a standard causal transformer architecture as our backbone, which is trained to predict the next action given the past context. We use the same adapter architecture proposed for large language models, which has a bot bottleneck structure to reduce parameters while keeping the same output dimension. Previously, the task adapters are learned independently of each other, but often tasks are hierarchical in nature and structurally similar tasks can benefit from task transfer. For example, if we have adapters for picking up objects and opening a drawer, can we combine them and leverage the shared knowledge to then learn how to put an object into the drawer. We explore two different designs for combining adapters. The first is adapter fusion, which trains a self-attention layer to fuse the outputs of learned adapters at every layer. The second is weighted adapter composition, which learns a new set of adapter weights and scalar coefficients that linearly combine the outputs of existing adapters and the new adapter that is being learned. We evaluate our approach on the MetaWorld Robot Manipulation Benchmark. We pre-train our model on data collected from the training tasks and train adapters for the held out tasks. We're also working on extending our approach to other environments like RL Bench and a continual learning benchmark for embodied agents. We compare our approach shown in the blue curve to two baselines and an upper bound of fine-tuning the full model shown in yellow. We find that training task-specific adapters, which use less than 1% of the base model parameters, can achieve similar or sometimes even better performance compared to full model fine-tuning. We also find that adapters are data efficient, achieving strong performance even in low data regimes because they are able to effectively leverage the priors from the pre-trained model. We also present some preliminary results on combining adapters for long-horizon tasks. We create a new task in the MetaWorld environment of putting a block in a drawer. We find promising results showing that fusing learned adapters can achieve even better performance than full minor fine tuning, provided the same task demonstrations. In summary, we propose a modular approach for multitask robot learning and demonstrate that this is both parameter efficient and data efficient. We present some preliminary results which suggest that fusing learned adapters can accelerate learning on long horizon compositional tasks. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions or want to connect, feel free to send me an email.
Great. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. That concludes the uh, the spotlight sessions. We will take a very short break of about 10 minutes, but please do make sure to come back on time because we have an exciting lineup of invited speaker and uh, a, a very spicy panel discussion up soon. Yeah, thanks, Arvin. Um, yeah, I'd actually recommend everyone just to stay here because we'll start uh, pretty sharpish at half past. Um, and I imagine a few more people will come in from the coffee break too. Um, yeah, so see you in a few minutes. All right, everyone. Maybe uh, we can start by getting seated and we'll start uh, shortly. Great. Uh, it, it's my great pleasure to introduce Abhinav. Today, Abhinav is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He's also spent time in several industry labs like AI2 and FAIR. Uh, Abhinav's presence in this workshop is particularly relevant since in many ways he pioneered this idea of data-driven robot learning, both from passive videos as well as uh, on-robot interaction with self-supervised learning. So uh, we're all particularly excited to hear from Abhinav on the latest and greatest on the sign up work. No worries. Can you hear me, Arvind? Uh, yes, we can go ahead. Abhinav. Okay. All right. Good. Um, yeah. So in this recent years, we have seen this large excitement in self-supervised learning for manipulation. And by self-supervised learning, I, I'm putting both RL and self-supervised learning in this common category where you basically collect the data at large scale. Then you train your favorite deep learning model, whatever it can be transformer-based, are you are seeing a lot of transformer-based now or any uh, other models. What the biggest issue or the biggest bottleneck, as you can see like in Vincent's talk as well, is that the data is a biggest bottleneck in these uh, models that we are trying to scale. Like how do you get the data at large scale? So there are multiple ways of doing it. The first way is Vincent's way or the Google way, which is let's scale the physical infrastructure. And so for example, here is the first version of their physical infrastructure scaling, where they tried to put like 14 robots together. They collected 800,000 examples of robots trying to pick up objects. I think all of us would agree that maybe Google can do it at scale, but it's unclear whether this is the right approach or if all of us can even afford it, like in academia or other things. So this clearly is not the solution which is for everyone, uh, at least right now. The second one, which I think I hear a lot more, is maybe we can scale up by simulation, right? I mean, we'll collect lots and lots of data in simulation, and then some will apply some kind of sim to real approach to transfer. But of course, there are issues with sim to real. First, are you going to get visu enough visually rich information in simulation? Is it going to be enough physically rich? Uh, like how realistic is the physics and so on? But for me, those are not the biggest concern. The biggest concern in simulation is always going to be the missing diversity. So building each and every scene is very, very expensive, right? I mean, so building the assets, then having all the prop physical properties like right friction models and so on is makes it really unscalable to build hundreds and thousands of uh, scenes, essentially. So simulation has this issue of the diversity that is going to be missing in these scenes. Then, then there's a the philosophical approach as well, philosophical issue with simulation. Maybe simulation is a much harder problem than we are trying to solve. Remember, we are trying to solve the manipulation problem. In simulation, we are saying we want to predict each and every pixel uh, in the future. Whereas for manipulation, maybe we don't even need to predict each and every pixel. Like if I have to pick up this bottle, do I need to predict how would the every pixel of the uh, thing move? So to me, sim simulation is a much harder problem actually than even solving the manipulation problem itself. So one of the philosophical reasons why I don't think simulation is the right way to do it is, uh, is the harder problem prob thing. Some of the people can argue that this whole idea of self-supervised learning is not correct. And that's what probably Vincent's talk or other talks that you are seeing recently that maybe the right way to do solve manipulation is imitation learning. But even in imitation learning, it's very difficult to collect large scale data. It's slow. So for, for example, even after a year of the uh, experiments, they had 130,000 uh, trajectories only. And so um, it's going to be very, very hard to scale up even in the case of imitation learning. So an imitation learning would need some kind of scaling as well. So to me, the core issue is that collecting interaction data, whether it's live on a robot, or whether it's an interaction data via teleop is never going to be scale up 
to the large amounts of data. So can we somehow reduce these data requirements themselves? Now, how do we reduce the data requirements? Well, the best answer I always have is, let's think how do babies do it, right? I mean, it's clear that babies are not collecting millions of interactions as well. So how are the babies learning? So I'm sure that you have recently seen from any of the talks, people who are talking about like in, how interaction is critical, like these kind of videos where they show oh, babies touching the toys, putting toys in the mouth. And that's how people in AI would argue that this is why we need lot, lots and lots of interaction data because babies learn via interaction. And in fact, these are the exact kind of videos I have been showing for the last five years that why we need real robot data to learn computer vision itself, for example. But this is incomplete story. The amount of data that people or babies use by active interaction is much, much smaller than the amount of passive observations that baby do. And I think this passive data is so significantly larger that we can use this passive data for something meaningful. And so one of the ways in this talk I'm going to look at is how can we use the, how can we use the passive data? And by passive data, I mean, the agent observing other people or other uh, uh, agents in the scene, which is human, you humans or we humans essentially. And so how can we use the videos of people interacting with the different objects to learn priors or pre-training uh, as this workshop is calling, which can make adaptation fast, which can make us solve the real world problems much, much faster. Now we do know that pre-training is very, very common in computer vision and in NLP as well, right? I mean, we, use large amounts of data to pre-train some representations, and then we use it for uh, fine tuning. And in interestingly, um, our work with Arvind, uh, which was this unsurprising effectiveness of pre-controlled model, all, all, already started showing that if you use even ImageNet models or models, MoCo models trained on ImageNet and so on, they can actually outperform in many cases state-based models as well. It's showing that you can actually pre-train at least the vision part of it, uh, even before the thing. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we can actually go much further. How can we use large amounts of passive data? This is the passive by passive data. Again, I want to emphasize, I mean, watching others in the scene. How can we use that to pre-train for manipulation? First, I'm going to talk about how we can pre-train for manipulation for visual representation. Like how can we train a vision model using the data like this egocentric data, which is the ego 4D uh, data set, for example. And so in this case, what I'm going to assume is that the passive data is trained to used to train a vision model, and then we are going to learn policy on top of it. But in the next part of the talk, I'll go even further. I'll say we can not only pre-train a vision module, but we can even pre-train a manipulation module, the action part, the control part, by using passive data as well. And so in the second part of the talk, I'll focus on how we can use pre-train for passive data, using the passive data, even the manipulation modules themselves. And finally, um, based on how much the time I have, I will talk about how do this all fit together? Like if you have pre-trained, how should you fine tune in the real world? Because pre-training is only, only works if you can fine tune or adapt fast in the real world. And so I will talk about how you can adapt in the real world with these pre-trained models. What could be one of the approaches to adapt in the real world? So this is kind of my talk layout. First, I'm going to use lots and lots of passive data to train a vision model, and hopefully it will work for robotics task. Then I'm going to use lots and lots of passive data to train manipulation model directly um, so and see how it works. And then if you have a good pre-trained model, how can you fine tune in the real world by exploration? So the first paper that I'm going to be talking about is this R3M. This is a paper in this conference actually itself, uh, where we are trying to learn uh, good visual representation for robot manipulation. And so just emphasizing again, that generally currently the way robotics pipeline train is, you first collect demonstrations. This is exactly what actually Google's talk was. They collected 130,000 demonstration. They trained policy from images. They had a fancy robot transformer, RT1, whatever. But I, I don't think that matters. What matters is the data at the end of the day. Um, and then they deployed these policy with the image observations. What we are looking for is that this is always going to be very hard, collecting these demonstrations. So can we somehow cut these demonstrations and basically use some other extra uh, passive data to pre-train our vision models? Because a lot of this data is just pre used to train the vision layers, which are the initial layers of the uh, thing. And so uh, the way we are looking for is 
if we can somehow have some objectives, we can uh, we have some good loss functions that can help us pre-train for robotics tasks and some way of getting diverse data of humans manipulating objects. We can probably learn a good representation that can be used for downstream manipulation task. And so this is what the final will look like. We will first, when we have pre-trained our representation, we can download the pre-trained representation and then collect much fewer demonstrations and use that to deploy the policy essentially. So the cl clearly the most important thing here is what is the right data to pre-train a good vision representation. And then once you have the data, what is the right objective or the loss function to learn a good representation? Now, interestingly in computer vision, um, they have been recently collecting large scale egocentric data. This is called the ego 4D data, which has been released uh, recently. This egocentric data is a person wearing a camera here, and then the person goes and interacts with the objects. And this is the right amount. This is exactly the kind of data that we would need, right? Because it's a person interacting with the objects from a first person view. This is what the robot would also see. It's diverse because they have it collect, being collected, I think 10 to 15 different locations, maybe even more uh, different countries. And it also has some kind of uh, la language annotations. So in, it happens to be that we are also getting this right data at the right time. So this is the data which we thought is going to be exciting for us because it has all these interesting manipulations of cutting objects, opening doors, picking up ob different kinds of objects and so on. So we have the data of manipulation of objects, right? What could be the right objective to learn a good representation? So we definitely know that a good representation will have a different uh, representation for different states of the object. So this bottle, close bottle, and the open bottle, if I open it up, should have a different representation. I uh, tried to open it, didn't open. Um, so the idea is that the representation should keep change, changing with time. Remember in computer vision, this is exactly opposite to what people have been trying. People have been trying to have a closed bottle and an open bottle have exactly the same representation so that they can say, this is a bottle. That's the problem computer vision people care about the classification problem. In robotics, this is exactly the opposite. And so if um, ImageNet model does not work on, uh, on the task of manipulation, we know why, because it's not capturing the, it's not intended to capture the states of the objects. So the way we are going to capture the states of the object is by making sure that the, with time, the uh, representations should change. Um, we also have a language component of the, in the loss function, which makes sure that we are, have a semantically relevant part uh, uh, for the task. So the language model will capture the kind of change that uh, the, is happening, is, 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 uh, can be mapped to the linguistic component that opening of the bottle, for example, and so on. And finally, we want compact representations. So we will have a, some sparsity uh, term in the loss function. So by just using these three terms in the loss function, we train a representation on this uh, ego 4D data. And then we are going to test it on some uh, real robots, but also on lots of simulation tasks. And our hope is that this representation is good enough that it not only works in the real setup, which is what the data looks like, but it will even transfer to the simulation setups like uh, Meta World and so on and adroit and so on. So here are the environments that we are going to test on. The, on the left are the simulation environments, the meta world, Franka Kitchen and adroit, and some real world robots at the end. And so here are the, some of the results that we got uh, by pre-training on Ego 4D and then uh, keeping the model fixed and then training a policy on top of it. So it turns out that R3M works really good, even on the task or environments that it has never seen before and it's achieved 58% success rate. It's much better than Clip or Moco or even Supervised ImageNet. Um, you can assume why it's better than Clip and Supervised ImageNet because of the thing I talked about. They are not intending, they don't intend to capture the states of the uh, uh, object. And Moco does not have any uh, supervised component. So that's why it's better than uh, MoCo as well. And it has like 10% better improvement. And most importantly, if you were actually learning from scratch and not using any of this extra data, uh, Ego 4D data, you would have 20% less performance. So by actually using all the passive data that is, exists out there, you can do much better in uh, getting the performance uh, out of these models. And so then we wanted to test, okay, it, it seems to work on these uh, simulation tasks of like Franka Kitchen, Meta World Android, will it work in the real world? So we basically collected 20 demonstrations for every task. And we basically then used it to solve tasks, like for example, putting lettuce in pan. So here's, here's a video of uh, the policy uh, performance of lettuce in pan, then pushing mug to the goal.
this is closing drawer putting mask in a dresser and folding towel it oh yeah and um, we did our compare to clip as well, and this works significantly better than a clip-based representation that has been uh, pre-trained. Okay, so hopefully I can I have convinced you that this kind of R3M, uh, which is trained on passive data, no real robot data, can actually still give you uh, good performance. And I think the key here is this is using all all out of domain data. It's not using any in domain data, and the model is out there. Anyone can use it. Oops, sorry. Um, so if you are trying to do any robot experiments, my advice is just download this R3 model before you try to train from scratch. Maybe you can get some savings out of it and it's available for everyone to use. Um, for sure, we have tried it in multiple projects. Um, and in fact, there are multiple papers that have used R3M and they were seem to be working much, much better than the baseline. And in fact, one of the papers that I'm going to talk about is the next one, which builds upon R3M and then goes even one step further. Okay. So uh, I started with this idea that we can use, and this is an obvious one, right? We can use lots of videos of uh, egocentric data to train a good visual representation for manipulable objects. But can we go even further? That's my uh, next question. So till now, I have been assuming that all this passive data of observing the world can only be used to train visual representations. This is because I'm only thinking of pre-training as a state encoding. But can I go even further? Can I actually use representations that can directly be a good policy or value learning functions themselves? And so this is the work which is basically learning to manipulate by learning to see. We are not going to use any manipulation data, still going to try to do manipulation uh, without e even a single robot data collected, just from passive data itself. So, and I think this will, will be the key way. If we can actually transfer all the passive data somehow to active interact, sorry, interactive data, we can think of the diversity of the data that we can have uh, essentially. And so the big question is how can we do that? So I think to understand that we have to take a step back and we have to think what do we need representation for? Till now I've been thinking that we need a good representation as an input to the policy function. That if I have a good representation of the pixels, then I can use that as a state vector and feed it into the policy function. But maybe representation can play a much bigger role. And to understand how it can play a bigger role, let's understand what we try to do with imitation learning or any policy learning. Uh, so any policy learning, what it does, it, it tries to predict action, right? Given the current state, it predicts the action that will take you, help you go towards a goal state. That's what policy functions are. Now, what we know is that action prediction is a significantly hard problem. So let's say my task was reaching the bottle. This action can also help me reach the bottle this action will also help me reach the bottle. So action prediction is hard because it has multimodal, uh, multimodality. Multiple actions can lead to the same goal. And that makes it really, really hard for your deep learning policy function to basically learn a good uh, policy function. And so that is why we have been seeing that if you do not have a good, uh, nice, clean data, it's very hard to do imitation learning out of it. And people, that's why use kinesthetic trajectories and so on. We know action prediction is hard. What, what if we don't even predict actions? We re-evaluate, re instead of predicting actions, we are just going to predict the distances to the goal state in the uh, representation space easily. Now, this is something which we know works because in computer vision, we know you can learn good representations which have good distance functions in the visual space, essentially. So the distance function works. And this we know from the all the models that are being learned in computer vision. If you can learn a good distance function, so let's say my goal state is this, and I want to, know, and if I can learn a distance function between this and the goal state, and if I can have a good distance function, then my action prediction or the policy is very, very simple. So it's going to be something like this. Let's say this is the goal image. This is my current state. I am going to hallucinate multiple possible actions. I am going to hallucinate what the future looks like if I took that actions. And then I will just compute the distance between the current, like the hallucinated state and the goal state and choose the one which help, takes me closest to the goal state. Something as simple as greedy. Every time I have to make a decision, I'll take a greedy decision. I'll say, okay, if I take this action, what, how close I get to goal. If I take this action, how get to, close I get to the goal. If I take this action, how close I get to the goal. 
whichever is the bring me closest to the goal i choose that action the once i choose an action then i again redo the same step keep doing this greedily one step uh, planning and then reach basically the goal state so the policy is as simple as greedy based on the distance function that you have learned in the representation space so all we need is a good representation in the uh, which uh, a representation which has meaningful distances uh, essentially meaningful dynamical distances so how do we learn that so let's assume we have lots of passive videos of P of interaction happening. So here's a case of in a passive video of, uh, we are observing a video of a uh, human moving a cup to the goal location. What we do is we first do some kind of structure from 3D reconstruction of it, which is like structure from motion to predict the trajectory graph, like how the hand is moving uh, to reach the goal state essentially. Then we sample any random initial state, current state and the goal. And we just try to learn the distances between the two uh, state. And the, to learn the distances, we are going to use simple contrastive learning essentially. So let's say you are at this observation II, you take an action in the trajectory space. Uh, this is the real action that we have taken. And we say, okay, this, we are going to assume that the trajectory is an expert trajectory. So this uh, distance between the real future state and the goal observation has to be less than any random other action you could have taken. So this is a simple contrastive learning we are going to do. So let's say I took any other action. I can hallucinate any other action and say, okay, if that was the future state, that should be much farther than the real action that I'm seeing. So all we are assuming is that expert is taking the optimal actions. If expert is taking the optimal actions, all other actions are going to be worse actions than the expert actions. And by just doing these augmentations of different possible, hallucinating different possible actions, we train our uh, representation with meaningful dynamical distances. Now, one part is missing, that this idea of hallucination. To do hallucination, we also learn this future predictive uh, model, which is given an action. Uh, you predict the uh, representation, and you do the reconstruction loss between your prediction and the real uh, observation in the future. And so now you have these two functions that you have learned, the future predictor and the distance predictor. And just based on that, you can basically uh, do the whole uh, planning, one-step planning model, which I talked about. To collect the data at scale and to make sure that the SFM reconstructions are good, we basically collected data with stick. So you, we can, you can buy this trash uh, stick from online for $15. We put a camera on this and we started collecting data of opening drawers, putting object things into one, uh, turning plugs and so on at large scale with this uh, data. And uh, so this is what the, some of the results look like. So here's a task on pushing. Uh, we also put the same stick on the robot so the so that at least we don't have to do the mapping between the hand and the robot uh, pixels so the, the pixels look similar for the human action and the robot action and so here is the robot trying to push it to different again in these cases we have no uh, access to the action real action all the actions have been predicted from the passive videos uh, and hallucination so this is the pushing task here is a pick and click task. This is the door opening task on a, like a play kitchen. And finally, uh, knob turning. So here's a knob turning task. Okay, so we compared the performance to like simple behavior cloning. So in behavior cloning, we can assume that whatever actions we predicted from structure from motion are the ground truth action and we can do either real behavior cloning or implicit behavior cloning. In both cases, it does not work. We tried also with offline RL approaches like IQL. Uh, again, they do not perform as great. And then we also try to use ImageNet representation as the representation itself in which we can compute the distances. It does not work as good as actually learning the dynamical distances uh, themselves. So uh, using this dynamical distance representation learning helps a lot in better representation learning. Just to take this point even further, that this idea that uh, there's a multi-modality in action space, like multiple actions can lead to same consequences. So we actually just tried it on this 
simple task where we have an obstacle so there are, there are multiple actions possible to reach the goal state and see how would the behavior cloning work versus our approach work where we are just predicting distances rather than uh, the actions and uh, this is just an experiment which shows that we do significantly better on this multimodal actions uh, in this case so hopefully the takeaway is that you can use large amounts of passive data not not for just learning vision representations but even pre training for good manipulation uh, representations in cells so let's say you have pre trained so we still have to fine tune or adapt in the real world so the last part of the talk i really want to quickly talk about how we can adapt in the real world how much time do i have oh um yeah i'll co conclude in 4 5 minutes um so this is a work which was in rss uh, which is human to robot imitation in the wild and so the idea is that given a pre good pre trained model and a example of the new task that you want to learn how would the robot adapt uh, to the new task that you exactly uh, did so the approach is actually pretty simple let's say you have this video of a new task that you are trying to see using the priors the pre trained model you have an initial policy and now you have to basically um, you leave the robot in the real world it keeps on making multiple tries until it basically gets the similar video as close video as possible to the original human video uh, essentially so the goal the the task that we are trying to solve is align the video that robot produces and the human produces to be as close to uh, similar as possible and so the way we are going to do it is by learning two policies together so the task policy tries to minimize the distance between the human action and the robot action and then there's an exploration policy because it might happen that you might never hit or you're never not even close to the real action so to make sure that you if you're nowhere close to the real action you can still explore and go do better is you also learn an exploration policy so the task policy is making sure that the feature of the robot action and the feature of the human action are semantically similar the reward for the exploration policy is to maximize changes you want your actions to create some changes in the environment and so you basically start with initial policy you'd see if you execute the initial policy in the in the real world you see how close the video you get then you start exploring by trying to do more changes into the environment and see how close you are getting to the uh, human action that you are seeing in the scenario and so here is an example of how the robot improves over time so it saw a video and now it's trying to learn to how to open a door this is all happening by itself the robot is keeps trying as it keeps trying it sees the video is it's generating is similar to the human video or not initially it does not hit success but once it starts hitting a success it gets keeps getting better and better at learning the policy so by iteration 3 it's actually is really good at learning to opening the drawers but for me the most exciting part about this work is not the or not only the framework but the experiments that we have here we for the first time we are showing uh, imitation learning on very diverse set of task and not just pick and place task i want to be clear here that you might have seen some imitation learning experiments or which look diverse but they're all pick and place this is much more diverse you can see opening drawers putting stacking cups opening taps so these are kind of the much harder contact driven tasks than simple pick and place of picking out potato chips or putting here and uh, and so on and we are doing it learning all uh, adapting it all in the real world and so we did not one not two but 20 tasks uh, from taking trash bags and uh and so on like arranging chairs and so here are the 20 tasks that we uh, did like folding uh, cloths and so on and all these imitation learning experiments have been done just by using passive video of human trying to do that action okay last and not the least all this is useless if we can not compare and so we do need to benchmark um i do want to highlight that we have a new benchmark that we are proposing which is train offline and test online the idea is you can collect large scale uh, data set uh, which we have released of for uh, offline rl or behavior cloning you can then learn your own policy and then send the policy to us and we are basically building a robot cloud where you can evaluate your the your own policy the our hope is by building this robot cloud we can make robotics possible for people who do not want to do hardware robotics yet want to do this kind of action and decision making we can make the education for example for the first time available for tier 2 colleges who cannot afford to buy robotics and in the process of this as we are building this robot cloud which is going to be accessible to all of all of us we will create the biggest large scale dataset uh, in this scenario 
And so if you are interested, uh, you can look at this website, totobenchmark.org. Uh, and it's very simple to contribute your own models uh, for benchmarking. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Abhinav. Uh, if there's anyone in the Zoom who want to ask a question, feel free to do so. Uh, for in-person audience, I think a mic is being passed around if you raise your hands. Yes, Ivan. Ivan, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, for RPM, we train on the Agro Food data. Right. Language. Right. How much is language? How much is um, so if you look at the paper, the language is helping around 10% uh, performance. So if I 48 without language and 58 with language on the task. Um, if you ask me personally, I don't think language is playing that much role, but I, it's my personal bias in thinking it doesn't. Stu the student author believes language plays a great role. And so even though I tried to convince him to remove the language, he would not remove the language. So, uh, but I, I mean, my intuition is it's language is not playing a great role, but I mean, I might be wrong. At least ablation-wise, that's language shows to be playing 10% role uh, in that case. I do think that, I mean, we have not used, like RCM is just like the first model that someone can train with ego-centric data. I mean, there is a lot that can be done in this area. Um, like, in fact, for like, I mean, since you and I are coming from vision background, I do think that this could be the next benchmark for vision people to uh, beat. Well, can you learn good representations that will work out of the box on robotics problems? which I don't think they work right now. Uh, until our first PVR paper, in fact, everyone was training from scratch. I think uh, after the PVR paper and af after our 3M uh, paper, I am now starting to see more and more people use pre-trained representations rather than learning from scratch, which is exciting for me. Really. Sorry, yeah. Right. I just don't, uh, yeah, I mean, I think your question is awesome, but I just don't think we know how to learn from videos properly yet. Uh, like by videos, I mean real, I mean, we are still using the video component because of the temporal dynamics uh, laws that we have and so on. But I think we can use video in a much better sense, for example, predicting the future and then comparing it to the future and so on. Um, or learning like a transformer model on videos and stuff like that. Um, personally, I feel like this is something which is the biggest problem in front of vision people as well. Like, I mean, learning a good representation from videos, no one knows how to do it yet. Um, yeah, so I think it's a very open problem. That's why we do not use uh, videos. We tried, I don't think it worked. I think Arvind has a paper, also tried something on learning from videos directly, but yeah. Okay, yes. Right. So actually, I think that's a really great question. I mean, so in the second part, we try to have the very similar morphology. That's why we replace the robot gripper by the gripper that exactly is the similar. But in the third paper that we are talking about, we were actually able to in-paint the grippers with the new gripper, like any gripper that you want. So in now nowadays in vision, the advancement in with diffusion models and stuff is so high that actually you can hallucinate if a human hand is replaced by a robot hand, how it would look like. So I think we are very close to bridging this morphology gap, if there is in a, some amount of training data between the, to learn the morphology gap essentially. So I think that is a very exciting uh, advancement to me. Like if, if I can look at all the human doing action videos and I can hallucinate if I was doing the same thing from robot, how it would look like. Now it becomes so much easy, right? I mean, it just, I just need to visually match the videos and it would start working and so on. So we are trying some diffusion models to see if we can directly map human actions to in pixels to robot action in pixels. But I mean, this is still a work in progress, but I think this is possible for now. All right, I guess. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. That's fine with that. I can speak again. Okay, great. Um, so we're going, now going to uh, move on to the best paper award. Um, and then we will have the panel discussion.
Okay, um, so uh, the we have a uh, Dyson Best Paper Award, and it is called so because uh, the winner will actually win a Dyson product of their choosing. Um, any any product, whether it be uh, vacuum cleaners, um, robot vacuum cleaners, air purifiers, etc. Um, so before that, um, I'll quickly just show what Dyson has been up to for the last uh, few years. Uh, Arvin, do you want to try and share the screen actually on your side of the slides and play the video? Just give me a second, I'm setting up. Thanks. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> Uh, ironically, it seems easier to share audio remotely than in person. So that speaks something about technology these days. Yeah, yes. It is very exciting. I'm not sure there are that many people doing this sort of stuff we're doing out there in the world. So this hangar over here, this hangar 86, is completely full of engineers working on wearables. In this building, we're focused on robotics. There's a big future in robotics, it's saving people time, performing chores for people, and improving people's daily lives. For I mean, I'm a parent. You know, I've spent half my life cleaning up after my kids, and it's, it's pretty tedious. We've been working for about 20 years now on floor care robots, which are puck format robots. And ours really do vacuum, by the way. But aside to that, we've also been doing a lot of research into robotics, which no one's aware of. So for the last 10 years, well, we've been sponsoring the Imperial College so actually, the work that's going on in these PhDs is ripe right now. So we're um, setting up a robotics tech office in London, as well as Singapore uh, and here. So between the four locations, in effect, bringing everything a bit closer into the live projects we're working on, the, the subject, what you're actually developing, accounts an awful lot in terms of excitement and attracting engineers. The tricky thing is that we can't overtly go out there in the world and say, hey, this is what we're doing, because it's very top secret. This is why we want to reveal a little bit more to the world. We're after 700 engineers of robotics. That's what we're looking for, to, to work on the brain, robot brain, essentially. We're in a, a small team of experts doing big things. Um, we can get there, but we need more people. It's a bit hard for me to climb over. Yeah. So. <laughs> so it's basically deploying advanced robots in household environments for mapping the environments, understanding the structure of the household. I was a bit shaky when I come in here, but we call this an arm room. And it needs to be as compliant as possible and safe in a home environment. Is it able to take impacts like this? We're trying to achieve something that's very, very complex that no one has achieved so far. Over here, uh, it's a very, very exciting rig. So what this arm is doing is it's able to map that chair in three dimensions. So this, this means I'll never, ever find crisps down the back of my sofa <laughs> again, not. ever. So you're coming in here. So this, this lab is the perception lab. This is all about the brain, about the vision systems, how the robot is interpreting the environment through sensors, cameras, thermal imaging, being able to map humans and navigate through the world. But there's also things we're learning that we can feed back into uh, the other products and the other categories 
to enhance their functionality and performance for consumers. One of the very exciting things about robots, as with wearables, is they are the future of Dyson. Uh, we're looking forward to a 10-year lens and further. Um, we've always done that. We've always invested in the future with the digital motors, with batteries, and knowing what we want to invest in and drive towards. Okay. And the best uh, workshop paper award goes to self-supervised pre-training of 3D point cloud networks with image data um, by Andre, Brandon, Edwin, and Jonathan Kelly. So let's have a round of applause for, the, for them. And I do think I saw Andre on the uh, call. So congratulations. And yeah, we'll be in touch about the prize. Okay. And for the final uh, section, we will move on to the uh, panel discussion. So can the panelists please come down to the front? Thanks. And uh, uh, Joseph, I think, said was going to be potentially five to 10. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> Here he comes. OK, so. Um, Please, uh, both online and in person, um, participate in the discussion. Um, I'll kick it off with a first question, um, and also the other organizers will uh, pitch in as well. But you know, we really want you guys to to be involved in this discussion as well. Um, okay, so question number one. Um, so the vision community has a uh, clear set of benchmarks uh, where they're able to assess the quality of uh, pre-trained features, vision features. Um, what does this look like for robotics? Yeah, I guess like, is that um, a really difficult thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, like, is that benchmark any different to just regular robotics benchmark? Yeah, I guess what, well, to start off, I guess, like, is that benchmark any different to regular robot learning benchmarks? So the fact that it's a pre-trained, you, you know, you're evaluating specifically pre-training, is that different to if you're evaluating, let's say, the, you know, the fine-tuning algorithm? Um, I guess, um, yeah, I, and if, and if, if it's, if it's, if there is any difference there, then I suppose you, what you would do is you would say, okay, so, You've got a pre-trained network that everybody has to use, and then uh, this is sort of the, the non-pre-training version of this, and then everybody would fine-tune on that. So I guess if you're doing a pre-training benchmark, you would try and flip that maybe and say, um, okay, everybody has to have the same fine-tuning mechanism, and it's all about coming up with the best pre-training. Um, so, But then that opens up all these questions of, okay, well, what's the best robot learning algorithm that you fine-tune with, and that's kind of that's a, you know that's an open question as well so uh maybe you'd have to have you know a, a state of the art behavioral planning benchmark state of the art reinforcement learning benchmark state of the art model based learning benchmark and then see whether i don't know all of those methods when applied to your pre-trained network uh, outperforms somebody else but i think with robotics it's just you know it opens up all these questions about benchmarking in general where there's so many different factors to Include that it's yeah it's very very difficult to to come up with that kind of unified benchmark. Yeah. 
we had a whole workshop on this in the morning so um i don't i, I don't know how many people are present there i don't want to add too much to it but i mean i think although i feel like it's a little easier here than what we were talking in the workshop we were talking about the benchmark for robotics here i think we are saying do we need a benchmark for pre trained model let's say vision model and so on so in that case i feel like maybe there's a simple way where you can have something like a ground truth uh, like a data set of current state goal state and actions and this might not be the only possible actions but if you can get the distribution and say in the distribution uh, this is what so i mean it doesn't even have to be real trajectory data it could be like a static data set and eval evaluated on where you have been given the current state goal state and the action and you can just match like how much percent like what percentage are you giving to this action if you are giving 0% to this action that means your models are pretty bad actually to begin with and so on so i feel like here if we are not talking about a robotics benchmark but only a benchmark for like let's say pre trained vision model i think we can do something easier than it needs to be like a static data set so that everyone is happy uh, i feel but i mean if you are talking about robotics benchmark then i think there is a host of things that we discussed in that workshop like i mean like is this the right way to approach the problem and all the all those issues and so on yeah i was also in the the, the morning benchmarking workshop so it was it was a rather long panel um but i guess the, the only thing that that i'll add is i, I do think that it's really in pre-training, I, I do think that we should be pre-training more than just visual representations. And I think that any sort of evaluation should, um, I mean, at least in the, well, if you're only pre-training a visual representation, it only needs to capture that sort of thing. But ideally, I, I think I'd love to have pre-training play a role in exploration, play a role in action. Uh, and I think that the, yeah, to evaluate that, we can't just um, be like fine tuning something like a head on top of features. Uh, maybe to follow up on that question, Stephen, if I can. So, uh, like, do you see a role for simulation in this pre-training benchmark? And like, simulation is in a particularly unique situation here because, unlike the typical sim to real gap, you have more of a real to sim gap when you pre-train real data and put it in sim. So, if something trained on real data works in sim, perhaps that's a strong sign that will that it might also work in real. So. Do you think there is a value for simulated benchmarks or should we primarily just be focusing on real benchmarks? I generally really like the idea of something that kind of pre-trains in sim and then evaluate, sorry, pre-trains in real and then evaluates in simulation because you can get all the rigor of doing lots of simulation experiments uh, and you get all the kind of uh, reproducibility and ability to compare methods very in a very detailed way. Uh, I still don't think that there's any kind of replacement for running experiments on real robots, uh, but I do think that um, like a, a really a kind of a strong paper, a strong kind of result in pre-training would be something that probably has some real to some experiments and also some uh, some real robot experiments that are probably a little bit less thorough, but um, are actually kind of still demonstrating the efficacy on real systems. Oh, yeah, we have a question from the audience. And so you compare with the imaging, or we can think of the imaging system. So at the level of the that maybe it's given that it's not a function, and then bring it to a point to use a model that are present as a result of some complex situation, for example, for a second. Actually, that's the data to be given instead of using like uh, it, it's not like can we use the to put up a bed uh, and like to go up that and what to be uh, so I mean, it is Sorry, quick, worth. Do you mind? Uh, oh right, that, yes. Yeah, so the question was, um, have you tried other kind of incorporating other forms of supervision into the R3M objective? Um, I guess it's worth clarifying that R3M does. Uh, it does actually. It's not kind of fully self-supervised, and it's using language annotations from the Ego 4D videos. Uh, and we did find that that was quite helpful in in, in ablations. Um, we. We also experimented with using uh, combining other data sets like robotics data sets and didn't see significant improvements with the robotics data sets that we tried, but um, there that doesn't like have kind of rule out the possibility there. Uh, we didn't really try any other forms of supervision, uh, mostly because the well, at least it, in my mind, I think that um, it's worth trying to focus on the supervision that is most widely accessible and from from which you can get the broadest data. Um, but yeah, yeah, we didn't experiment with it too much.
something that we can do right and that we can do well. Do you have any insight on that? I have like so something that was doing the objective like that. So I can get up. Yeah, so the question was um, like what like things like object detection and segmentation like are, are obviously going to be much more kind of relevant to robotics than classification. Um, and so perhaps that supervision could be good. Uh, we we did, certainly didn't try it in the context of the R3M work. The um, I will say that in my lab, we have tried things like off the shelf object segmentation models and at least zero shot. Uh, they, they don't work well. Uh, and we haven't been really wanting to kind of label uh, bounding boxes and, and so forth to fine tune these models on the robot because that's just a, a very manual process and, and I'd love a system where we pre train it on lots of offline diverse data, maybe it has some annotations, maybe not. Um, and then have the fine tuning process be really minimal effort like ideally fully autonomous um, on the robot or a few demonstrations rather than requiring kind of a lot of manual effort. Um, so from from my perspective, the um, I, yeah, I'd prefer to not have to kind of do any sort of manual annotation during fine tuning. Yeah, I do know of some work by like TRI, for example, that has kind of done forms of pre-training with simulation, like lot, large scale simulation and, and using lots of annotations in simulation. Um, I think that even then you might like, you might require some in-domain fine tuning uh, just cause I mean, every, like every robot environment is different. At, at least I personally haven't found any vision models that work off the shelf uh, in, in a novel robot environment. Um, I don't know if anyone else has, but uh, yeah. But I, I, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to a, a different question. Um, so are action uh, labels important for pre-training? Uh, if so, how can we get it? And how uh, how do we deal with the trade-off between getting actions is quite expensive? Uh, to link with your data, like what, what's the trade-off between no action that's pretty cheap to collect versus action data, which is more expensive, but far more valuable. I mean, in the long run, I think we should accumulate very large amounts of robot data such that it's not expensive anymore. So, so team scale over here, real world robot scale. I mean, I think there's another solution is, you know, thinking about the structure of robot learning so one of the things that we see is everybody's sort of doing behavioral cloning for collecting data but if you structure trajectories in a certain way that the the image data is actually more important than the action data in terms of the learning then you can capitalize on on the image pre-training a lot more than the action pre-training so that's a way of it might be a kind of a shorter term solution than than uh, actually collecting large-scale action data but it's one way of dealing with the fact that image data is a lot easier to collect than than action data. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's there's ways to think about, okay, there is this this limitation in terms of how we get the data, but you can, you don't have to do behavioral cloning. You know, there are other ways to do imitation learning. Um, and I think, I think that's an important thing to consider as well. I do want to add that um, whatever Chelsea is saying, I mean, I agree that I mean, if if there was enough robot, real robot data, it's always better than uh, passive data, but it, there will never be enough. Like uh, real robot data will never be the amount of passive data that you can get on the internet. Um, so, I mean, I want to say that while robot data is critical, it, the it will be much more beautiful if we can somehow use the passive data to learn like what you are saying, uh, that we can somehow directly learn actions from the passive data itself because the amount of diversity and so on will be much, much more higher in that passive data. Like even the Google example where they collected 130,000, I thought it was not diverse at all. They, they think it's diverse, I think it's completely not diverse. And so, I mean, to me, the, when I talk about diversity, it's the different kitchens, it's the different uh, objects and so on. And so I feel like it's just, okay, I don't want to say impossible because they, I'm sure it's going to happen someday, but uh, it's very hard to get very diverse data from the robot actions really at this point. 
Uh, any opinions about this from the audience? I have something uh, here. Yeah. So I, I guess maybe a related question is, uh, there isn't a single robot platform out there, right? Like every lab has their own robot platform. So different people have different arms, the grippers are different, the hands are different. So if you're talking about like action collection on robot, like which robot are we talking about? Like if I connect with robot X, is it going to be useful for a different robot Y? So then like, even if we collect data with the robot, it seems like you have to collect it with so many different robots or agree to standardize on one robot. Uh, or, and if we think we can transfer information across robot, it feels like then we should also be able to transfer information from uh, humans as well. So it's kind of uh, an interesting chicken and egg problem. So maybe someone has thoughts on that. I'm sorry, we somehow, we've gone to benchmarking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think this is necessarily benchmarking. Um, I mean, I do think that there is a fair amount of critical mass around a, f a few robots, and um, we could certainly have efforts. Uh, kind of, I think we could. I mean, right now we're basically doing zero sharing of data across labs, and I think that uh, anything is is greater than zero, uh, and so. Um, like even if we kind of put out data sets that are on one platform that are that's commonly used, then uh, it should be possible for other labs to to pick that up if we can get the kind of diversity that Abhinav is mentioning with like lots of different kitchens and households and so forth. So um, I, I think I'm I'm somewhat optimistic about that. I also think that in the long run we should be trying to share data across hardware as well. Um, in, in computer vision, we don't like only use data from one camera uh, and like we don't like kind of silo data by camera, for example, by hardware. Uh, and so um, certainly it's it's a lot harder in, in robotics, uh, but it seems like it should be possible. Yeah, this is the one problem I also thought about a little bit as well. Um, I guess one thing we can obviously do is that we can actually abstract actions. So we can transform one of the actions of the one agent to the another agent, and then uh, we can collect the data at the abstract level. But I guess that the question is, how do we actually learn this transformation function between agent to agent too? But I think that's ultimately way to go, especially even if we think about humans, if I see other people doing some actions, I actually essentially transform their action space to my action space and actually perform the learn from their demonstrations too. So I think there is a way to go, except that we are actually not really exactly dealing with it because it's too hard to share any data at this point too. I feel like a, a lot of kind of relatively simple tasks can be solved almost just thinking about it as a vision problem. So you basically got an object that you would get from A to B. And once once the object's in the gripper, then it's just a matter of doing some kind of visual servering. And that's something that can be transferred very easily from one object to another. And that's how uh, one robot to another. That's often how third person imitation learning works as well. Um, so maybe if we really want to focus on the pre-training, then we actually a lot of things we can do just by really uh, studying pre-training on the vision side and the action side is becomes a computer vision problem. However, it's only going to work for maybe 90% of the tasks. It's not going to work for screwing in a light bulb or something like that, where the action data is really, really important. So yeah, I guess we've got to decide, do we want this one method that works really well for 90% of the tasks, or do we see that as just a short-term solution and say, well, that's not the point. And actually we should develop a method that's going to work and it's going to take longer to get there. But once we develop it, it will work for hundred percent of tasks. So are you asking what are the challenges to go from 90% to 100%? Sorry.
Sure. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess, um, I guess better computer vision, so tra tracking objects, tracking hands, things like that, that's, that's one solution to this. Um, that doesn't necessarily, yeah, that's not necessarily based on, on sort of diverse pre-training, maybe, maybe that is just a, you know, a 3D computer vision problem. Um, so there's, there's kind of solutions on that side of things. Um, I guess, I, I think like the, the high level um, stuff in robotics is also very, very important. Often we focus on like individual tasks and say, hey, how can we teach a robot to pick up this object or open this drawer? But how does a robot know that it should pick up that object and how does it know that it should, should open that drawer? I think that's, that's another problem that um, wouldn't be solved just from, it's not going to come from the computer vision community. So sort of the high level planning. Um, so I think that's that's another problem when, you know, even if you could use computer vision to 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 solve individual tasks, and often we do just benchmark on, okay, can you solve this task? Can you solve that task? Can you solve that task? Of course, with the robot in the real world, it, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna have a human there to say all these things because you might as well just do it yourself if you're gonna tell the robot each task. So the robot the human wants to send a high level command and then the robot should then convert that into a lower level task that it's already learned. So there's that also needs to be solved to, to make the 90% tasks actually useful in a practical environment. Just to understand, are you asking what are the remaining 5% of the tasks? I mean, so. I mean, how, how to solve it? How to solve it? I mean, I so I mean, I think all the static, not too dynamic tasks are those ninety five percent of the tasks. First, just defining what are those ninety five percent of the so like a catching and a throwing is not in those ninety five percent because they're very dynamical and force is very critical and so on. Um, I feel like what is missing in those ninety five percent of the task is a good representation. So while R three AM or we have talked about all these papers, they're not even close. To getting the right representation they're not even close to learning the future model i think what we learn need to learn is a good dynamical model and this is a problem which is not only for us even for computer vision or everyone is trying to this whole idea that given the current image action what's the future image going to look like i think that's the problem which is i think the core problem that has to be solved for every given environment not just your uh, and i think if we can solve that to me that i think i think there's a core that will solve the 95% of the world in, in some sense. So I, I mean, I think that's what we are trying to learn from these things. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the difference between those 95% and 5% is the force, like the, wherever you need to have better idea of the force and everything like, uh, and so on. Those I think you cannot just solve, like by just looking at someone throw a ball is very hard unless you try a few times to throw a ball yourself. This is maybe a little bit off topic, but we, um, we've been working on some like pretty dexterous manipulation tasks uh, that I think are not, like you cannot solve just with vision. Uh, Things like uh, zipping up a hoodie, um, using a zip tie, like a cable tie, uh, and um, uh, opening a ziplock bag, and so forth. Uh, and actually, you can do all the tasks without force feedback. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't think it has to do with force. But uh, this is kind of a side note. I actually, I mean, okay, I think, um, I think what the reason it might not be working is because the computer vision of Dexter's hand also is, does not work that great yet. I mean, uh, I do completely see task where it's all about the, the getting the right trajectory uh, should be able should be possible via vision uh, alone i mean it's just that where you need to know the right forces and right thing to apply that's where you need to try it yourself
see the images or any text that don't add up. And the why is only here about a decision, which is maybe part of the reason why it's hard to answer directly. So I wonder if, if large scale data collection is due to just the key points to get the level of precision required for the why or I agree that zero shot foundation models will not give you the precision that you want, but typically fine tuning them does does give you quite a bit of precision. So I do think that pre the, the, the fine tuning step is very important. We can't just pre train. We also need a post train. Um, but I yeah, um, well, at least from what I've seen, I think that the, the fine tuned models work quite well. That said, I guess I do still think that robotics requires more precision than like image classification, for example. And so uh, I don't think we should necessarily like I don't think that if we like get all the success that computer vision and, and natural language has gotten, I don't think that we would succeed in robotics yet. I think robotics is a harder problem uh, and we'll need more, but uh, we're certainly haven't done that yet. So I think we should at least do that. <laughs> So I guess like when you're talking about these artifacts, I guess like if you're taking a model that's something like text to image or text to 3D or something, yeah, the, the images don't look that realistic. But in a robotic sense, it would be text to something lower dimensional than that. So maybe text to uh, joint velocities or end effects pose or something. So, so there's a smaller space over which you're generalizing. So it might be that actually those artifacts disappear when you go back into robot space. Unless you're going to be doing, as as I was saying, predicting images and then rolling out those images, in which case the artifacts will probably accumulate over time if you're planning. But if you bypass predicting images and go straight to predicting actions, then I think these artifacts will be less problematic in robotics. Okay. Um, okay, let's... Uh change things up just a little bit so uh oh there is a question oh yes go ahead please Well, like Joseph should answer this one. <laughs> yeah, I guess I don't really have much to say right now. Um, so I put you on the spot, but I know you work on right. the skills. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Bias it. And I don't think I have much good answer to this right now. So does anyone? I mean, so uh, in my second part of the talk, I mean, I kind of rephrased learning representation as the skill learning itself. That's what I was trying to kind of highlight that if you have good representations, you can actually go ahead and solve the skills out of it directly without uh, taking any manipulation data itself. Like if you are a good representation would capture the distances properly. And if you can capture distances properly and you have a good rollout model, like uh, it should be easy for you to solve the uh, task as well. So for me, again, I mean, it's all about uh, like pre-training in, in the case of uh, would mean like a good dynamics model, because if you have a good dynamics model, you should be able to do the rest of the uh, thing. Now, of course, you, you can go without learning the full dynamics model, but just dynamical distance might be good enough, or you might want to learn the full dynamical model and so on. Uh, that I think is a, a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I generally agree with that. And I think that there isn't any one right answer. I think that there's like lots of stuff that you can pre-train, like uh, it could be value functions, goal condition value functions, Q functions, uh, forward dynamics models. It could be skills that have some kind of parameterized skills. Um, I think that there's lots of different forms that it could take language condition policies. Uh, and I, I don't think we should necessarily converge on one right answer either. I think that like as a community, we often, some approaches learn models, some approaches learn uh, policies directly and, and so forth. So I think that we should explore uh, multiple multiple different options. Well, like when it comes to the actions, also things like curriculum learning are quite important in that as humans, we, we, we develop our skills over, to, over years and we start off with very clumsy skills and then we get more and more 
precise as we get older. Um, so I feel like with actions, it may be less about um, just pre-training and fine tuning, but more about coming up with a curriculum of actions that get more and more complex over time. And so the distinction between the pre-train and fine tuning disappears a little bit and it becomes, you know, the fine tuning from the previous iteration becomes the pre-training from the next iteration. Uh, Arvind, do we have any online questions? Uh, not at this point. Uh... Okay. Um, so yeah, kind of similar vein, um, but for this question, I don't want you to say it's a combination of all of them. I want you to try and pick a particular one. And the question is, based on the evidence that we have today, what is the best form of free training, whether it be um, unsupervised uh, vision pre-training, uh, skill learning, um, uh, multitask training. Yeah, if, if you had to pick one of those, what would you do with, uh, which one would you choose given today's evidence? Also given today's data or? Uh, with today's data as well. I mean, I guess you could give your answer like two ways, like based on today and what you hope could be in the future. So maybe I'll start say, if I try and think, okay, say, let's say we're optimizing for how many tasks could we solve with this method? And given that a lot of tasks are pick and place, and that's quite a visual problem, and a lot of pick and place you can solve just using computer vision, um, I think kind of unsupervised training on image data sets gives you that understanding of images uh, a natural distribution of images generating images with things like uh, diffusion models that look realistic give you realistic arrangements of objects um, that can then be turned into a robotics uh, problem without needing to learn any actions and I think you could solve a lot of problems with that without any robot interaction at all so if you could only choose one, I think that's what I would go for. If you wanted to solve as many robotics tasks as possible, even if they were only the simple ones. I think that the, um, in the short term with today's data and, and so forth, the, well, I guess in some ways, I think that maybe my answer is the same uh, for, for both short term and long term, which is that uh, I think that like if we have a ton of compute, uh, then just training like forward visual dynamics models, uh, I think are, are incredibly powerful and we have tons of video data out there. And so I think that if you kind of scaled up the models with a massive amount of compute, you probably would actually be able to get a really good model and that, that could allow you to do all sorts of things. So um, we could probably get like, I think in the long run too, if we, as we get more robot data, these, these models will get better too, but that's, that's probably what I would do. Okay. So we have two votes for unsupervised kind of vision video pre-training right now. Well, and it could be an action condition model. It's like semi-action condition. I mean, I was going to say the same thing. So you can have that, you can make it the three vote as well. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I mean, we're getting data. I mean, one thing I will say about dynamics models is I think that they, like we can plan with them quite well. They, they do tend to be a little bit tricky to, for learning long horizon tasks, especially if they're very expensive. Uh, you can do dyna style things, but it's going to be really expensive to generate data from them. So um, I do think that there, there is a lot of merit to pre-training value functions of some form as well, uh, or, or distance functions um, along with a, a model like that. Because uh, if you have both of those two things, then you, um, you'll probably be able to do longer horizon things as well. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, go ahead. There is an online question, actually. Uh, if it's a good time. Yeah, so I, I guess this question is about how the pre-training community in Coral can better interface with the pre-training communities in computer vision and NLP. And it seems like we have largely been a consumers of the pre-training technology and models from the other communities. But do you see 
an opportunity for us to be better integrated with that community? And is there an opportunity for robotics to give back to computer vision or NLP, either as a test bed or in some other way? Yeah, so I think, by the way, uh, when I actually came into computer like robotics, I never came in robotic, into robotics to do robotics. Uh, this, this is like a fun thing. When I started doing robotics, the reason I wanted to do robotics was to actually improve computation models using the robot data. And my first paper was not that, but the, my second paper was exactly, which was trying to use all the robot data that I could collect in the lab to learn a, like a, a ResNet model, which will then try to do better classification, detection, and so on. To me, I think that dream I still want to do. But what I realized in the last five years is that robot data is just so biased and they're so not diverse that I can never believe improving any computer vision stuff by using robot data. It's very, very hard to me. And I think that's where, I mean, I kind of drifted now to the other side where I'm now using computer vision data to improve robotics rather than uh, using robotics data. But I still think we can go back and if we can improve computer vision models just using robotic data, that would still be a dream, but only if you can collect robotic data in the wild. I just don't know how to collect that in the wild yet, at least. I do feel like a lot of the computer vision community has been fairly focused on image classification and uh, especially in terms of pre-trained representations. And I think that robotics tasks are more are more spatial in nature. You like you don't need to just tell me that's a cat. You need to like tell me where should I put my hand to pet the cat uh, and like where are the ears and so forth. So. Um, I think that certainly there there could be um, like if we develop things that are good for spatial tasks, then it may also contribute to other computer vision tasks that are more spatial in nature. Um, although at the same time, I think that there there are people could also just use those space like other spatial tasks in computer vision as well. Um, so yeah, but there is an argument to be made that even classification tasks can be improved by robotics data. Just to understand that, like because some of the classes are actually based on the task themselves, like chair. A chair is for sitting. Right, I mean, a chair as a class by itself is very hard to learn, but when you know the action it has to be used for, like sitting, you know how it is. Similarly, I think I mean, um, we had a paper which is like uh, the functional correspondence thing. The idea was if you can somehow functionally correspond objects, then you can actually learn much better representations that will work much better in computation for few short generalization problem. And I think this is one of the papers which I loved doing, and uh, but no one wants to uh, look at it. Uh, but I feel like the, the whole point of the paper is that if you can actually go from, uh, like if you can actually somehow learn representations from actions, like the control itself, I think we are having this discussion. If you can learn representations which are good for affordances, they might actually work really good for classification themselves. We just don't know how to get that thing working yet because we don't have the data for learning good affordance models in the wild. So I feel like it's all about robotics data in the wild. To me, what will make pre-training this whole workshop very exciting and make the whole room full is if we can somehow get good in the wild robotic data. And I mean, like I think Chelsea was saying that she wants robotic data. I also want robotic data. It's just that so hard to get robotic data in the wild and make everything full. I mean, I, I, th I think we should have a discussion on how can we make it exciting. And I think that's to me is the exciting. If we can somehow all of us work together to maybe collect, and I think Chelsea has a project in this direction, which I really like, is that if we can somehow collect data in the wild, robotic data in the wild, and somehow use that to improve, if we can give that to computer vision community and language community and so on, I mean, that would be the, that would just change the whole narrative. Right now, the narrative is pretty bad. Like, it's not as exciting, I would say. So I've been up. Do you actually believe um, the only missing hole is data at this point? No, oh, no, I said the biggest missing point is data. Right, right. I, I guess. Right, right. Sure, sure. Absolutely, as good as data. I see. So I guess the reason I'm asking this question is, um, you know, of course, I develop a simulator and also trying to collect real data and whatnot. But at the same time, I'm realizing more and more that. You know, we also don't have a method that can work and simulate the data either. Even with tons of data, data we can generate, it's there's no really real good model that can learn dynamics of it, and that also bothers me a lot too. Even in the simulator, you think? 
simulator data, the, the data, that's what I think Vincent's experiment was doing. And it was a beautiful experiment in my mind. It was saying that amount of data does not matter. It's the diversity of the data that matters. This, whoever does simulator just keeps on forgetting that they are thinking that if I can get more 100,000 interactions in one second in this environment, it's useful. It's not. It's more environment that is useful. Now, I'm not saying humans do like that. Humans learn completely differently. Human yes. babies can learn from few environments and generalize much faster. It's all about the diversity of the data, I believe, which is missing. Simulators cannot do that, at least not yet. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh I'll just jump in here. So are, are you kind of almost insinuating that like um, models you can't overfit in these environments? Because if you were, for example, had billions, uh, uh, billions of data in a particular environment, you could overfit, right? So you could actually learn. Like di diversity doesn't matter in that case if you're trying to overfit on that one environment, right? Because because you said that even if you had like loads. I don't know, saying that the current models are so bad that they cannot even overfit into one. Therefore, you are. I mean, is that what you're saying? Basically, yes. Yeah. What, what is the nature of the data? I mean, I, I, I guess know. just, I guess even any data, I guess in general, like, you know, our funnest assembly data, a benchmark or whatever else, like meta or all that as well. I mean, one thing that I could mention is that we've, um, well, I, I think that if you have demonstration data, um, like my, my experience is that you should be able to get it some like if you have enough demonstration data, you should be able to get a policy that that really works. Um, so that, that was asking about the about that. Um, I ha we have actually noticed scenarios in which um, it is like with kind of standard approaches to policies, uh, it can actually be a little bit difficult to overfit to a set of demonstrations, and it sometimes does actually require some some delicate choices there. It all, this also connects a little bit to um, Victoria and Abedov's work on, th they found that, uh, and, and maybe Sudeep, they found that kind of these op more open loop policies sometimes actually work better than closed loop policies. I think that we actually have some architectural choices and design choices that uh, are actually somewhat important that we need to make, and that can actually be important for getting things to overfit. But if you make those choices right, I think if you have enough demonstrations, uh, it certainly should be possible to, to overfit. Yeah, I guess my question was more than like the pure being experiment from the scratch and we are learning in the simulated environment. We still don't know how to efficiently do the best learning and all that. I guess that was my challenge. Yeah, ex exploration is hard. Uh, actually, of course, with uh, more days and whatever is important, but I also uh, continue in the uh, saying that, like, are we sure that the equation can change? I mean, I frankly, I, I should could have just said, I don't know the answer really. Like, what is a better way to encode states? I mean, uh, I do want to say that I, while I believe the mask autoencoder story for language, I do not, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of the mask autoencoder story for vision yet. I mean, and we can have a debate on this uh, completely. I was having a debate with Jitendra on that as well. I don't think mask autoencoder for vision work uh, that well uh, because they're not scaling. I mean, from all, all I know from all the internal of other people doing these experiments, they're not scaling at all. Uh, they are not as scalable as thought initially. And so now I might be wrong. They might scale later. Like someone might be able to scale them later, but at least currently mask autoencoders in vision are not scaling at all. Um, that said, I mean, what is a good model for encoding states? I actually don't, if I knew I would do it, <laughs> I would I would have a paper, uh, another paper on it as well. I mean, I think that's the critical thing. Right? Like current vision models are not really incorporating states and we just need a good way of representing states really. I mean, I don't know how to do that yet. I don't know if someone knows how to <laughs> incorporate states. Yeah, question of that. What role does the 
expectations for any uh, future data that you're going to have. If your data is big enough, maybe you don't have to do it, or if you're saying it's too big, you can actually go back to the um, well, somebody, somebody said earlier today that, um, yeah, domain randomization, I think it's just Tendra was saying domain or augmentation um, is, is supervision because you have to basically engineer your distribution and you have to choose, uh, you know, what kind of uh, augmentation to do. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure. I, I feel like it's for, for, for robotics, it's very, very... Uh, it's a very useful thing to do because actually we know the kinds of distributions over which a scene will vary. So we can say, hey, there's a scene here, you've given a demonstration to pick up an object, but that scene might be darker later, or maybe the cube will be blue instead of red or something like that. So I think actually we can, we can engineer the distribution or the, the variance that we want to augment that, those images over um, in a way that we... Uh, might not be able to do for more kind of semantic type tasks. Um, but that only solves one kind of generalization, it only solves generalization over illumination. Um, it doesn't solve generalization over shape of objects um, or material properties. So I think it gets you some way, and I think it's pretty easy to get generalization to illumination conditions, which is uh, which otherwise would be very difficult, but I don't think it really helps with uh, generalization across shape of objects, um, you would then have to start coming up with models of how objects, you know, what's the natural distribution of an object's shape and how does that vary? To learn that, you would probably then have to collect the data anyway. So that that's uh, kind of all part of that same problem. It's not an independent problem. But yeah, I think generalization to illumination is pretty pretty easy to do with domain randomization. Does anybody else want to give an answer to that question? No. OK, this is a five second warning if anybody has any final questions. Otherwise, we will wrap up. Arvin, any online? Uh, no, none at this point. OK. Uh, in that case, uh, let's thank the panelists. Thank you. And yeah, that brings us to the end of the uh, workshop as well. So thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you for the speakers. Thanks for the uh, presenters as well for the poster. And thank you to my co-organizers for all the help today. And I hope everyone enjoys the welcome reception. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks.